So before we start coding, I think it's important to know the keyboard shortcuts because they greatly improve your efficiency. So eventually we're going to be using the brackets text editor and I'll be using these shortcuts in brackets pretty frequently. So the first shortcut is to save a file. And in brackets, you know your file is unsaved if there's a dot next to the file name. So right here and right here. So to save your file, all you have to do is Command S and that saves your file. Another helpful shortcut is copy and paste. So first what you gotta do is highlight what you wanna copy. And then to copy, you use Command C and then go to where you want to paste whatever you copied. And to paste, all you have to do is Command V. You can also cut lines of code by highlighting what you want to cut and then use command X and then go to wherever you want to paste that code and just do command V. And you can also paste what you just cut or copied in other files. Now you'll notice that we have two unsaved files. So instead of using command S in each file, you can save all the files at the same time with command option S. So now you'll notice that there isn't the dot next to the file names. Another helpful shortcut is searching your file. So let's say I had a really big file with a lot of code in it. To search that file, I could use the shortcut Command F and search whatever I want to find. And it will highlight it for me. And if there's multiples, you can see that I can go through every occurrence of whatever I want to search. Another helpful shortcut is to replace words or characters. And that shortcut is Command Option F. And it will give me what I want to replace. And it will let me search up anything, just like Command F, and then I could replace it with whatever. So I could replace every occurrence of the number seven with that, and then just go through each one, and it replaces every seven with three A's. You can also replace things that aren't necessarily in the file that you're editing. So if I wanted to replace the four here in file one, and, and the fours in file two, I could use Command, Option, Shift, F, and I can replace four with hello. Then it will show me every occurrence of four in what files. And then I could check which ones I want to keep and which ones I don't. And then I could just click replace. And there you go. And then it replaces every four with hello. Another helpful shortcut is if you have a really long line and you're kind of lazy to just use your mouse to do that. A much faster way to go to the ends of the lines is to just use command and then the arrow keys, which is helpful if you have a really small font size so it's kind of hard to pinpoint the end of a line. So using command and then the arrow keys is pretty helpful. And the last shortcut that I sometimes use is highlighting lines without using my mouse. And all you have to do is use shift and then you use the up or down arrow keys. And that comes in handy every now and then. Oh, and some more shortcuts would be to increase the font size with command and then the plus sign, or you can't really tell here because it doesn't show the plus sign, but that's where the plus sign is. So I could increase the font size or decrease it with minus. Okay, and this is the last shortcut. And sometimes I use it, but not really, but it's just helpful to know. And that is to write on multiple lines. So let's say I wanted to write two lines that were exactly the same or pretty similar. I can write on both lines by pressing command and then I could click on wherever I want to type. So now I could type on two different lines. So those are just a few shortcuts that I use every now and then, or pretty often, and I think they're going to be really helpful and make you a more efficient coder. Okay, let's start coding. The first thing you want to do is open up an internet browser. I recommend using Chrome. And then you want to go to Replit. And when you first open up Replit, you'll see a page that looks similar to this. You want to select JavaScript because that's the language that Phaser uses. Now for our first line of code, let's start off with console.log. Console.log is primarily used for debugging, so you'll find it very useful when you get stuck writing code. Now between the parentheses, let's just say, hello world. Run the code, and it prints hello world to our console. Now the shortcut that I just did, instead of clicking run, was command enter. So with console.log, you can print out anything as long as it's in quotes. You can also type in numbers false, of course true, null, and undefined. We'll be getting into these terms later in the course, but for now, congratulations. Believe it or not, you just wrote your first line of code. Now let's learn about comments. Let's say we have some code. 
And let's say we're having some trouble figuring out what this code does. We can add a comment like this. Comments are just comments that you write on your code to make your code easier to understand. So notice, to make a comment, you start off with two forward slashes, but this is only for one line. To make a multi-line comment, you would use this syntax, forward slash, asterisk, asterisk, forward slash, and then write your comments between the two asterisks, like so. And now you have a multi-line comment without having to constantly write the double forward slashes, like this. So don't do this. Right now, commenting might seem useless because we've only learned console.log, but as your code becomes more complex, you'll find commenting to be very useful. It's especially useful when working in a team environment or if you haven't looked at your code in a while and you're trying to figure out what your code does. Commenting helps you understand your code quicker and easier. So get in the habit of commenting your code. Okay, before we go on, I'd like to point out something that might confuse a lot of beginners, and that's spacing in JavaScript. So right now, you don't have to know what all of this means. We'll get into all of this in later videos. The point I wanted to illustrate was that spacing does not matter as long as you're not dealing with reserved words. And by reserved words, I mean words like var or function. And I just wanted to point out when I run the code that all of our variables work perfectly fine. Same with our functions. However, let's remove the space between our reserved word and our function name. We can see that we already get an error. And the error that we're getting here, missing semicolon before a statement, doesn't really tell us what's wrong because this is just the wrong syntax for making a function. There has to be a space between a reserved word and the name. The same goes for a variable. If we remove that space, we can see that the colors changed the JavaScript engine doesn't know that num5 is a variable, so we need to have a space here. But you can see here, the space doesn't matter on the sides of equal signs or math functions or math operators. But let's not get too ahead because we're going to be learning all about these in future videos. So I just wanted to point out that spacing only matters when you're dealing with reserved words like function or var. And there are a few other reserved words, but function and var are the two most common. Now let's learn about math and JavaScript. For this video, we're just going to focus on our console in Replit. So, in JavaScript, you can compute math equations with different operators. So for addition, you would just use the plus sign, subtraction, the minus sign, multiplication with the asterisk, division with a forward slash, and these are your four main math operators. There's also modulus, which is the percent sign, and modulus gives you the remainder of one value being divided by another value. For, for example, 9 modulus 2 gives you 1, because 2 goes into 9 four times, giving you 8, and that gives you a remainder of 1. You can also use parentheses to do math inside the parentheses before doing the math outside of the parentheses. For example, 9. So math in JavaScript just follows the math order of operations. You can also add words with other words, or words with numbers, for example. So you can see here, if we add a word, as long as it's in quotes, and add it with a number, JavaScript will add the number to the word. And of course, you can add words with other words. However, you can't subtract words or multiply words you can only add words, which is called concatenation. So now you know how to use the math operators in JavaScript. Now we're going to learn about the comparison operators. Comparison operators return either true or false. And usually, you would use comparison operators in conjunction with while loops, if statements, else if statements, and a few other things. But for now, we'll just focus on the operators themselves. So for example, equals equals is a comparison operator and it checks for sameness. So 1 equals 1, that's true. 1 is greater than 1. 1 is less than 1, it's false. You can also do 1 is less than or equal to 1, that's true. There's also greater than or greater than or equal to. There's also not equals, so 9 equals 9, 
that's true. But 9 not equals 9, which is the exclamation mark with a equal sign, that's false. And this will return false only if the left side of the operator is equal to the right side of the operator. We can also compare words. So that makes sense, right? There's also another operator, which looks like this, which is three equal signs instead of two equal signs. And the only difference here is that this is the strict version of equals to. So for example, one equals one, that's true. However, if we put one of the ones in quotes and one one not in quotes, it returns false because the strict version of equals to checks for data type. And what that means is, well, for this example, this one is a number, but this one is a string. And a string is like a word. And words don't equal numbers in JavaScript. It's kind of confusing right now, but we'll learn about data types in a later video. But for now, congratulations. You just learned seven different comparison operators. Now let's learn about variables. You can think of variables as people, and these people only have one job, and that job is to remember the last thing they were told. It's kind of hard to conceptualize at first, but it'll just make sense the more you practice. So to make a variable, you start off with var, and then the variable name, and then the value. And then you end your line with a semicolon. Now a semicolon is just like a period at the end of a sentence. In JavaScript, semicolons are not necessary, but they make your code easier to read. So I recommend using them as often as you can. So your variable can have any name, as long as it doesn't start with a number. Believe it or not, one of the hardest parts of JavaScript is naming your variables. So here, variable name is not a good name for our variable because it doesn't give us a good representation of what our variable means. I think num makes more sense. So this variable is a number type. Its data type is a number. It can also have decimal points, and it can also be negative as well. The next kind of variable is the Boolean. And that can either be true or false. Booleans can be used for things like if statements, while loops, and a few other things, which we'll get into a later video. The last kind of variable we're going to learn is the string type. And a string is anything that's in quotes. A string can be empty, like so. And of course, it could have words in it. It can have spaces. It can have sentences. It's just anything that's in quotes, and JavaScript just looks at this like a sentence. So if we run our code, nothing happens because we're not console.logging anything. Now in our console, we don't have to write console.log. Our console does it for us. So if we want to console.log num, we just type in num. And we could see here it equals negative 123.0123. Bool equals false. And we can see here it equals false. And string equals whatever this says. We can also add variables with other variables. So we can add string with num. And we can see here that JavaScript just concatenates our number variable to our string. We can also reassign variables. So right now, this is what num equals. We can reassign num to equal something else, like that. And now we can see num equals 3, 4, 5. Same thing with Boolean variables and, of course, strings. Now there's two more types of variables I'd like to teach you, and that would be null and undefined. So null and undefined mean kind of the same thing. Basically, null and undefined mean their value is nothing. The only difference is when a variable is set to null, we are assigning it a value that is a value that does not exist. And you can see here, we're getting a warning because this is redundant. An undefined variable is a variable that is just declared like that. So once again, a null variable is explicitly set to equal nothing. An undefined variable is just a variable that hasn't been defined. Now let's learn about arrays and objects. An array is like an empty folder. And this is what they look like. So this is our empty folder. And with arrays, we can hold lists of information. And we separate each element with a comma. And it's good to space things out. So here, you see we have an array, which has a length of five, or it has five elements. And arrays are useful because you can use them like lists that hold similar elements. So what if we only want to get one element from our array? We would use something called bracket notation. And that looks like this. So here, we are using brackets to get the first, 
element of our array, and that returns one. So when you want to get an element at a specific index in an array, you would start from zero. So let's say we want the fifth element. Since we start at zero, we know that the fifth element is at index four. So zero, one, two, three, four. And we can see here, we get five. We can also have arrays that have different data types, like so. And that's just because JavaScript is a very flexible language. In languages like Java, you would only have arrays or array lists that can only have a single data type. But in JavaScript, you could see here that we can have different data types in the same array. And of course, we could also have variables in our array and objects. So this is an empty object. Objects are very similar to arrays, except there are a few differences. One being it uses the curly brackets instead of square brackets. And when we put stuff in objects, we give each element a property name. So objects have properties, like so, and the properties have values. So let's make a human object with me. And you can see here that it's very similar to an array. The elements are separated with commas, but you can see that we're using curly brackets where we have to name each element with a property name. Or another way you could think of this is that objects have properties and properties have values. And let's just run the code. And to get a specific property of an object, we would use something called dot notation instead of bracket notation. So we can get human.name and we could see it's equal to Michael, age 18. So you can see the similarities between objects and arrays, but you can think of objects as, as things, like objects. And these objects have different properties. And so with that in mind, you can see that objects can be useful for, for storing character information. Because with property names, it's easier to know which value is assigned to what. Whereas in an array, each value is selected by its index. Now let's learn about if, else if, and else statements. This is where booleans and comparison operators come in handy. So this is the skeleton of an if statement. Between these parentheses, we put in a boolean value or something that returns a boolean value. And between these brackets is what our if statement does. So for now, let's just have our if statement console.log something. And let's make a variable called boolean and set it to true. And then we can put bool in here. Run the code. And we could see here that something is printed out. That's because bool is true. And because bool is true, our if statement runs the code between its brackets. If bool were false, and we ran the code, nothing would happen. Because an if statement will only run its code between its brackets if this boolean is true. We can also use our comparison operators. And because one does equal one, this returns true. And so our line of code is ran. And let's make this equal false nothing happens. So let's say our Boolean value is false. We could use something called an else if statement, which looks like this. And this is just an if statement, which the previous if statement defaults to if this if statement was false. So here, this won't run because bool is false. And then we'll check for something else. So we could just say if four is greater than one, it's true. And have this else if statement do something, run the code. And we can see here, this line of code is ran because this was false. So this if statement went on to the next else if statement. And because this is true, it runs this line of code. Now let's say this was false. We can use an else statement, which is the default statement for all if and else if statements. So this else statement will run no matter what, unless one of these if or else if statements are true. So let's have this do something, run the code, it prints out six because both this if statement and this else if statement are false. So it just defaults to the else statement. So one thing to know is that if, else if, and else statements should be ordered in specificity. And what I mean by that can be better illustrated by this example. So we have a variable called num and it's equal to 10. And let's change these if and else if statements and run the code. And we can see here that only something is printed out to our console, but we wanted this to print out because num is greater than six. This is what I meant by ordering your if and else if statements in specificity. So let's change the order of these if and else if statements and change our num variable to something else and run the code. Now let's 
change this so it's easier to understand. We can see here that num is not greater than six, so it defaults to this else if statement, and it prints out something to do instead of something to do, even though num is greater than one. So that's just something to keep in mind when making your if, else if, and else statements. Now you know how if, else if, and else statements work. Now let's go over while and for loops. I'm first gonna go over what for loops are because they will make while loops easier to understand. So to make a for loop, we start off with for and then parentheses. And between the parentheses, we start by declaring a variable, usually it's i, and set it to something. And then we'll set a limit for when to stop looping. So in this case, we'll have i is less than 10. And then we'll have something that increments our variable, which can be something like i++. And let's just have console.log in our loop and run the code. So what just happened? Well, we first defined a variable i, and then we console.logged it. So that's why zero is printed out because i starts off as zero and then it loops again. But right after you finish one loop, you increment your variable. And so that's why when this for loop loops a second time, i has been incremented by one. So that's why one is printed out and then so on. Now you don't have to always increment by one. You could also increment by two, like so. And one thing to point out is that it will stop looping when i is less than 10. So once i is equal to 8, it's incremented by 2. And at that point, i is equal to 10, so it's not less than 10, so it doesn't print out 10. So you just saw me use i++. i++ is the same thing as i equals i plus 1. Is there an i++ version for incrementing by 2? No. But you can do i plus equals 2, and that's the same thing as what we just had. So let's run the code. And it does the same thing because i plus equals 2 is the same thing as i equals i plus 2. So that's how a for loop works. Now, for a while loop, the syntax is this. And we'll just have our while loop do something for each time it loops. And for this example, we'll have a variable called i and set it to 0. So this is very similar to our for loop. When we run the code, we get the same output as our as the first time we ran our for loop. First, we're defining a variable i and setting it to zero. And while i is less than 10, it will run this code. So first, i is equal to zero. i is less than 10, so it console.logs i, which is zero. And then it increments it by one. So that's how we get zero through nine, because once i is equal to nine, it's incremented by one. So then it equals 10, which is not less than 10. And so it just stops at nine. So why would you want to use a while loop? Well, a while loop is useful for when you don't know how many times you're going to be looping. For example, if you had something random. So let's change things up. So math.random produces a number between 0 and 1, including 0, but not including 1. So it will go from 0 to 0 0.99999, etc. And each time we loop, we're reassigning i to another random value. So when we first run our code, it looped four times. Let's run our code again. It looped one time. Again, three times. So you can see that a while loop is useful for when you don't know how many times you're going to be looping. And that's how while and for loops work. Now let's learn about iterating through arrays and objects. So here we have an array variable and an object variable. Let's iterate through the array variable first. So we can just use a for loop. So one thing to note is that all arrays have a property called length. And length is just the amount of elements in the array. So let's run the code and it prints out each element of our array. We can also use a for each loop, which looks something like this. And we get the same effect. Now a for each loop is a little complicated because it uses something called a callback function. And what the for each loop does for an array is it takes each element and we're assigning it to i, and then we are console.logging i in our case. And of course, you could do a bunch of other things like incrementing i by 1. But we'll learn more about functions in a later video. Now, to iterate through an object, we can't use a for loop because if we try to, you'll notice that we'll get stuck. And just 
writing it out, you can already tell that we cannot get an index zero of object because we don't have indexes in objects. We only have properties. So instead of a for loop, to iterate through an object, we would use a for in loop like this. We can see that it prints out each property name of our object. Now, what if we want to print out the property values? Well, we would just take our variable and use bracket notation and put an I and run the code. And we could see that each property value is being printed out. So one thing that I didn't mention in my arrays and objects video is that you could use bracket notation to get the property value of an object. So just to clear things up, we have an object variable called obj and here are its properties and values. We can use bracket notation, but we have to put the property name in quotes. So p1, and that gives us one. However, if it's not in quotes, we'll get an error. So make sure if you want to use bracket notation when getting the property values of objects that you put in the property names in quotes. But I prefer just using dot notation because it takes up less space. So that's how you iterate through arrays and objects. Now let's learn about functions and methods. A function is basically a block of code that does something. So to make a function, we start off by typing in function and then a function name, parentheses, and then curly brackets. So instead of function name, let's call our function add. And between the two parentheses is where you put in the arguments for your function. So let's have a and b be our add functions arguments. And then our function will just return the sum of a plus b. So when we run our code, nothing happens because we haven't called our function yet. To call our function, we can either just do it in our console, like so, or we could assign it to a variable. And we could see here that num is equal to 16. So what's happening here? Well, when we call our function, which is when we type in our function name followed by parentheses, we are saying, let's use the add function, which takes two arguments. And then in this case, our add function just returns the sum of our two arguments. So eight and eight will be the equivalent of a and b in our add function. And our add function just returns 16. Now, if we don't have the correct amount of arguments and we run the code, we get not a number because we only have one argument. And our add function is looking for a second argument called b. But you could see here, we only have one. The same thing would happen if we have no arguments where our add function is looking for argument a and argument b, but here we haven't defined them. Now, if we don't have parentheses, we are just saying that num is the function. So when we run our code, we could see that num is a function and we can call num like so. Let's make a more complex function. First, let's make an array and let's have a function called iterate and it takes an array argument and then it will console.log before and after. And what we are going to do with this array is change each value. And let's call our function down here and run our code. To make things more clear, let's just rename this variable Bob and run our code. So we have a variable called Bob, which is an array. And then we are calling the iterate function on Bob. So our first argument will be referred to as array or ARR in our iterate function. So at first console.logs array, which in our case is just our Bob variable. And then it iterates through each value from our Bob array and adds 10 to each element. And then after it's changed each value in our array, it will just console.log after and our array after we've changed it. So function arguments can be confusing because of the names of the arguments. The names of the arguments are just for the function to handle. We don't need to have a variable called array so that we can call our iterate function. You can see here that we just have a variable called Bob. And then once we call the iterate function, the iterate function will just refer to this argument as array. And then so this function will just do whatever it does with array. Now a method is just a function of an object. So let's make an object. And let's give it a run property, which is a function. And this function inside of our human object, just console.logs running, run our code. 
and we could see that human.run is a function, and when we call human.run, it prints out running. So a method is just a function that's part of an object, and that's how functions and methods work. Here's one thing that I'd like to point out about functions. So let's say we have a function called hello, and it takes a number, and it has a bunch of if statements. like this. Let's run our code and then call our hello function. And we can see here, we're only getting one return value, and that's just num, even though we are also returning, or we should be returning num times two and num times three, because all of these if statements are true. So the point that I'm trying to illustrate here is that once you return something in your function, your function stops executing. So here we can see num is greater than 10, so it will return just num, and the function will stop executing. All of this code does not matter once something has been returned. Let's make another function called greater than, and this function takes two variables. Let's add in some if statements. Let's run our code, and let's just check to make sure if our two arguments are equal, we get equal. If our first argument is greater than the second argument, we get true and we get false if it's the other way around. So first, let me point out that if your if statement only has one line, then the curly brackets are not necessary. So this if statement right here is the same as this. But I'd also like to focus on this else statement. This else statement is unnecessary because we already know that if a is less than b, then we should be returning false. So we can just remove this else statement, run our code, and we get the same results. One last thing I'd like to talk about functions and methods is scope. And you can think of scope as, as where a variable can be used. So to demonstrate scope, let's make a function called hello. And inside our function, we're gonna be declaring a variable called num and setting it to a number. And then let's console.log num and run our code. And let's call our function hello. So we can see here that it just prints out the value of num. However, in this case, because we declared num with var inside our hello function, we can only use num inside the hello function. So if we try to print out num, num is not defined. If we define a variable called num and run our code, we can see that here, num is equal to six. If we call our function, their num is equal to two, three, four. But if we print out num again, we can see that it's still equal to six. That's because num inside of hello is a local variable, and if we declare a variable outside of our function, it's a global variable. So we have a global variable called num, but that num is different from this num. Scope is just something to keep in mind when you're making variables and functions. So now you know how to use functions and methods, but you also know how to stop functions from executing using return, and also about scope. Now we're gonna be learning about the developer tools, or dev tools. So on Chrome, to open up your dev tools, right click and then click inspect. You can also just use command option I and we can see here we have a bunch of tabs that tell us everything about our internet browser and the web page that we're on but we'll just focus on console. Console does the exact same thing as Replit. The only difference is is that you don't need an internet connection to use our DevTools console but also we don't have the split screen that Replit has which I like but it does the exact same thing that Replit does. However if you want to return to a new line, we can't click enter, we have to do shift enter. So when we are debugging our code, we won't be using Replit, we'll be using our dev tools. Now we're going to be learning about regular expressions. For this, make sure you're on rubular.com. It says Ruby regular expressions right here, but it also works for JavaScript. Regular expressions are used for searching a string for a specific pattern. So for example, let's type in a string here. And in our regular expression, we can type in a word that we're looking for. So here we can see that Michael is being returned. And at the bottom, we can see all of the different regex selectors. So let's say I wanted to search a string for three consecutive numbers. So let's just type in a bunch of stuff. And for our regular expression, we would put backslash D. And we can already see that we're getting every digit in our string. And if we want exactly three in a row, we would just do something like that. That's the gist of regular expressions. As you can see, there are a lot of options for regular expressions, but this is essentially how regular expressions work. So let's translate this over to JavaScript. 
let's make a variable string and just put in a bunch of stuff and run our code. To use regular expressions in JavaScript, the two most commonly used methods are match and test. So to use test, we start off with a regular expression and then put a dot. And then we're calling our test method. And between the parentheses, let's put our string, run our code. And we can see that we get true. So test returns a Boolean. And it returns true because we have a JK in our string. We can also use match, except instead of putting the regular expression or regex first, we would put in the string dot and then match. And then in the parentheses, we would put our regex. So something like that, run our code. And we could see here that we have JK in our string right here, as well as the index or the location of it and the input that we invoked the match method on. Now, what if we have multiple JKs in our string? Run our code and run the same function. We can see here that we're only getting one JK. What if we want to get all of the JKs in our string? Well, we can just add a G outside of the two forward slashes, run the code, and you could see that we get a list of every JK in our string. Now what the G stands for is global. So it will search everywhere in the string. The G is what you would refer to as a modifier. Now there's a bunch of other modifiers, but I find that G is the most commonly used. So another good website for regular expressions is regex101.com. And this is similar to Rubular, except you can see that the interface is a little more complex, but it gives you a list of all of the modifiers that you can use. And that's how regular expressions work. Now let's learn about map, reduce, and filter. Map, reduce, and filter are used for modifying arrays. Let's start off with learning how to use map. First, we need to make an array. Now that we have our array, let's call the map method on it. The argument we're going to put in for our map function will be an anonymous function. And what an anonymous function is, is just a function without a name, like so. In this case, this function is also called a callback function because we are using this map method on our array. And what map does is it uses this function, which we are about to make, and it will invoke this function on each element in our array. So for our function, we'll have one argument. And in this case, this argument will be the value of an element in our array. And what map does is it changes each value in an array. So we have to return something. In our case, let's return i, or the value in our array, plus 5, and run our function. And we could see that our map method returns a different array, which is the same thing as our array, except each element is incremented by 5. But if we print out array, we can see that it's still what it was before we called map. So to reassign the array value, we would just do something like this, where we are saying array is now equal to array with the map method invoked on it. So let's run our code. And we could see now that array has been changed. Now let's learn about the reduce method. So let's just switch out map for reduce. Now the anonymous function in our reduce method often takes two arguments, and those are a and b. So a is the current value, and b is the next value that you're going to add on to a. So let's just return a plus b. Run our code, and we can see that array has been reduced to 28, because if you add all of these numbers, it will equal 28. Lastly, let's learn about filter. So let's replace reduce with filter. And for our anonymous function, we'll go back to just having one argument, and we will be returning a Boolean. So if we return true, we will keep the value in the array. And if it's false, we will not include it in the new array. So let's just say if i is greater than 5, and run filter. So we can see here that array has been filtered so that only elements greater than five are included. And those were the basics of using map, reduce, and filter. Now let's learn about the this keyword and what this can be used for. So this is a very tricky concept. This refers to the current context of where we're writing this. So right now, if we just type in this, we get the window object. However, you cannot assign the this keyword to anything. This simply refers to the context that it's in. So let's make an object, and let's give it a function called hi, and hi will just return this. So let's run our code and call the object.hi function, and, and it returns the object obj. So to better illustrate this point, let's add some more properties. Run our code, and let's call the same function. So you can see here that when we call the hi function, 
This refers to the object that this is in, and this is in the obj variable. I think a more practical use for this would be to make a constructor function. And a constructor function just makes an object. So here we have a constructor function, and it creates a new object. And to make a new object, we can just set it to a variable. We would use new, and then call the function. Let's run our code. And we can see that Bob is now equal to an object. Now it's very important that we use the new keyword, because that lets JavaScript know that we are trying to make a new instance of an object. So without using new, Bob is still undefined because our human function doesn't return anything. So again, the new keyword is important so that it lets JavaScript know that we're trying to make a new instance of an object. Now I'm going to go over some tips and tricks in JavaScript, which you might find pretty useful in certain situations. The first thing I want to talk about is using quotes within quotes. So let's say I have a string and we're not getting any errors, so that's good. But what if I want to say, I'm going to the park? And you can see already that we get an error because to JavaScript, this doesn't make sense because it's like we have our own string right here due to the single quotes here and here. So there are two ways to fix this problem. The first way is to use the backslash. And the backslash is known as the escape character because it allows you to use a single quote between two other single quotes. And when we run our code, we don't get any errors. And the backslash quote is just a representation for one quote. Another way you can fix this problem is to use double quotes and to just have a single quote inside. And when we run our code, we get the same output. And so with that in mind, you could also use a double quote inside single quotes, like so. The next trick is the ternary operator. So let's make a variable called number. And then you want to have a Boolean or something that returns a Boolean and then a question mark. And then the value if the Boolean is true, colon, and then a value if the Boolean is false. And we could see that number is equal to one, two, three, because this returns true. Because it's true, we are setting number to one, two, three. If this were false, it's now five, six, seven, because this is false. And so our ternary operator defaults to the second value that we state. Let's go back to the string that I had at first. So we know we can get the length of an array, like so. But we can also get the length of a string. And that returns the amount of characters in a string. And that includes quotes and spaces. Another cool thing you could do with strings is bracket notation. So if I wanted to get the first letter, I could use bracket zero. And the second character, I could just use bracket one. So it behaves very similarly to an array. And the last two tricks I'm going to talk about are related to objects. So let's just make a object. So here we have a variable called human. And it has a property called name, and its value is Alex, property called age, and its value is 23. And it has a property of sports, and it's an array of three different sports, golf, basketball, and football. So one cool thing you could do in JavaScript is add properties to an object without having to do them while you declare the object. So you don't have to do something like this. We can actually just use our object variable, so human and then the property that we want to add. And then we could set it a value like so. And when we print out human, we can see that we just added the property called property and its value is one, two, three without having to add it here. The last trick is related to constructors. So let's make a constructor and create a new instance of human. You can see here that we have a new variable called Bob, and it's an object with two properties. Now, what if we want to add another property to our constructor without having to modify the constructor here? We can use the prototype object. So for example, human.prototype.run, and we could make a new function or a new method. 
And now we have a run function as a property for our human constructor. So now Bob has a run method. And when we run it, we can see that run is actually a method of human. So these are just a few tricks and tips in JavaScript. There are a lot more. So these were just a few to get you started. After you've checked out Code Wars, Coderbyte, and Free Code Camp, and you have a good understanding of how JavaScript works, you can start learning how to make games with Phaser. So the first thing you want to do is download a text editor, and the one that we're going to be using is Brackets. So just go to brackets.io and just follow the instructions for downloading it. Next, you want to go to phaser.io, download, download Phaser from GitHub, even though it doesn't actually bring you to GitHub, and download the min.js file. The phaser.min.js file includes everything that you'll need to create a phaser game, but the file's been minified, so it's smaller. Next, you want to create a folder, and let's just call it phaser demo. And in that folder, you want to create another folder called phaser. And then you want to drag your phaser.min.js file into that phaser folder that we just made. Next, you want to open up brackets. And it will first show you this code of how brackets works. The main reason why I like brackets is because of the live preview button. It creates a local server and it shows the updates from your code in real time, but it only updates HTML and CSS in real time. So because we're going to be making games with JavaScript, we're going to have to reload the page every time we save our code, but the local server is what we really want. Next, you want to open up a folder and open up the phaser demo folder. And in our folder, we want to create a index.html file. And we have to create the skeleton of a basic web page. And this is what it looks like. We can click our live preview button, and it will show us the web page that we just made, which is empty right now. We can add elements to our web page by adding tags. So this is a header tag. And I could add content to the tag. But most of the tags we'll be using are just script tags. So other tags are out of the scope of this lesson. Next, you want to create a main.js file. And in that file, type var game equals new phaser.game, parentheses, and then the width of our game, the height of our game, and the renderer for our game, which is either WebGL or Canvas. But you can just put down phaser.auto, which picks the renderer for you. Next, create a state1.js file. And this file will be the file that represents the first state of our game. A game state is like a scene in your game. It could be menu state, or, or high score state, or game over state, or game state. But let's just call this state state1. So in our first state, we have to create a object variable and just name that object the name of your game. So in our case, let's just name it demo and set it to an empty object. Next, we want to add a state1 property to our demo object and make it a function. And then finally, we want to type demo.state1.prototype and set it to an object that has three functions inside of it. And those functions are preload, make sure to separate them with commas, create, and update. Let's go back to our main.js file and add a state to our game. And we do that by typing game.state.add parentheses, the name of our state or the key to our state, and then the name of the property in our demo object. So we've just added a state to our game. Now we have to start the state. And this will be the first state that will be ran when our game first loads. So let's type game.state.start parentheses and the key of our state, which is state one. Let's go back to our index.html file. And now we have to add script tags, which basically load scripts into your web page. So to add a script tag, we just say script, and we add a source attribute to our script tag. And for our first script tag, we'll load the phaser.min.js file. Because we put phaser.min.js in our phaser folder, we have to say the name of the folder first, and then phaser.min.js. This is the path of where our phaser.min.js file is. So this is what our script tags will look like. We start off with an opening tag and a closing tag. Make sure phaser.min.js is the first script that you load into your web page. Next, we'll add another script tag and set the source to our state one file. And finally, in our body tags, we'll load our main.js file. 
and then save everything. You can do so with Command S, which saves the file that you're currently editing, or Command Option S, which saves all the files. And you can see here that we have a black screen. This is the screen for our game. If we open up our developer tools, which you can do so with Command Option I, or right click and inspect, we can see that our black screen is a canvas element. What you just wrote was the boilerplate for any phaser game. And as of right now, our game is just a blank screen. Right now, our code is saved locally on our computer. But what if our computer breaks, or we want to work on our code on a different computer? We can save our code online, and the most popular way to do so is through GitHub. So go to github.com and make a GitHub account. After you've made an account, click New Repository. A repository is like a cabinet that holds all the files to a certain project. So let's just name our repository Phaser Demo, and create repository. Next, we have to open up our terminal. You can do so by using the shortcut Command Spacebar, and just type in Terminal. You can also use iTerm. iTerm and Terminal do the same thing, so it doesn't matter which, so it doesn't matter which one you use. So to save our code, we have to go to the correct directory. If we want to know which directory we're in, we use the command pwd, or print working directory. You can think of directories as locations in your computer. So right now, I'm at my root directory, but I want to be in the phaser demo directory. We can do so by using the cd command, or change directory, desktop, slash, phaser demo, and capitalization doesn't matter. And now when we print out our working directory, you can see that we are in the correct directory. Now we have to link our directory to our repository on GitHub. And we can do so with the following commands. git init git add dash dash all. This will add all of our files to our commit. Our commit is made on the next command, which is git commit dash m. And just say first commit. A commit is like a screenshot git add dash dash all adds all of our files to this screenshot and then we can push our screenshot to github so run this command and then copy this command on github which sets the origin for our remote and then use this command to push all of our to push our commit to our repository your terminal might prompt you for your github username and password so just enter those and you should be able to push your commit to our GitHub repository. So now, if we go back to GitHub and we refresh the page, you can see that our code has successfully been pushed to our repository. Okay, before we start writing more code, it's important to understand how phaser games work. So if you go to phaser.io, click examples, and it will give you a list of pretty much everything you can do with phaser. So let's just go down to input, and let's check out uh, this example. So in this example, I can move right or left depending on which arrow key I press. And below you can see the source code to the example. So because the author of this code only has one game state, the author doesn't have to say game.state.add game.state.start. This is the equivalent of those two lines. But what I want to focus on are the preload, create, and update functions. There's also a render function but that does roughly about the same thing as the update function, so we won't be using that for this lesson. So let's go back to the preload function. The preload function is primarily used for loading images. So, so here we can see the author is loading a ground image, a river image, sky image, etc. A sprite sheet is a collection of images, and it's used for animation. We'll get into what all this stuff means in a later video, because I just want to focus on the preload, create, and update functions. So the preload function is only called once, and that's at the beginning of your game state, and it's primarily used for loading images. The create function is similar to the preload function, except the create function is used for setting the initial values for everything in your game state. So here we can see the author is adding the background images, and because you only have to add the background images once, you put it in your create function. And here we're adding more images, and this line right here has the game camera follow the UFO sprite. But again, we'll get into what all this code means in later videos. The update function updates the frame of your game. It updates the frame of your game roughly 60 times a second, depending on the performance of your code. So going back to the example, our update function is being called right now, and my right or left arrow keys aren't pressed down. As soon as I press down an arrow key, the update function will check that, yes, the right arrow key is being pressed down, and it will invoke these properties on the UFO sprite. 
So each, fr so each frame in the game is a still image. So for example, this could be frame 1, frame 2, frame 3, frame 4, frame 5. And when you run those frames 60 times a second, it creates the illusion of motion. That is essentially how phaser games work. Now that we have one state, let's add multiple states. We can start by making another JS file. Let's call it state2.js. And we can copy all this code except for var demo equals an empty object because we only have to make a game object once and just paste it into state2.js. And now we have to replace state1 with state2. But instead of replacing 1 with 2 manually by just typing it out, we can use the shortcut command option F, and that will replace the specified word with the word you want to replace it with. So here I'm specifying state1, and I want to replace it with state2. Replace, replace. Command option F is especially useful when you have to replace a lot of words with the same word. Now let's go to main.js and just copy this line. And again, replace state1 with state2. Add another state script. Make sure you have the right file name and save everything. And you can save all the files with the shortcut command option S. Now, now if we restart our code, we have two game states. To switch states, we can use the same method game.state.start and use the key of the state as your argument. Run the code. And now we're in state two. But how can we differentiate between states? Let's go back to our state files and change the background color. We can do so in our create function. So type out game.stage.background color and you have to set it to a hex color like hashtag dddddd. Save our code restart our local server, and now we can see that state1 has the color of this hex color. Now a hex color is basically a combination of red, green, and blue. If you Google hex color picker and click the first link, you can pick any color you want, and it will give you the hex color for that corresponding color. So the first two characters represent red, the third and fourth color represent green, and the last two colors represent blue. So let's make state2 have a green background. I'll just copy this hex code and in state2 I'll type game.stage.background color equals that hex code and make sure it's in quotes. Save our code, restart our local server. So right now we are in state1. To switch states we can type game.state.start parentheses and type in the key of your state as the argument. So I'll just type in state2 and now we are in state2. Let's also add a console.log to tell us which state that we're in. Save our code, restart our local server, and now we can see when state one first starts, it console.log state one. If we switch states, we can see that state two has been console.logged. So now let's just add eight more states, states zero through nine. And let's just copy the code from state two and paste it and paste it in all the files that we just made. And now we have to refactor the code. And now we have 10 states. Let's save all our code. Don't forget, don't forget to load your script tags. And you also have to add the states in your main.js file. Save all of our code, refresh our local server. And now I can switch between states, but for some weird reason, sometimes you have to click the canvas element or the game screen for your game to start running. And here we can see that our states are working because they're console.logging what state they are. So right now we have 10 states, but our only means of switching between states is to go to our developer tools and typing out the game.state.start command, something like that. So instead of having to go to our console and running that command, we can make an event listener. So we can just press the numbers zero through nine. And when we do so, phaser will bring us to that state. So first, I think we should start with state zero. Save our code, refresh our local server, and we get an error. No state found with the key state zero. The error here is that I forgot to load my state zero.js file. Refresh, and we get another error. So this time, our console tells us that our error is in state zero.js, 
and it's on line one. So let's go to state0.js and it says demo is not defined. Well, that makes sense because we define it later in state one. So let's just cut this line of code, save that file and paste it in state zero. Save it, refresh our local server, and now we get no errors. And here we can tell that we are starting at state zero because state zero console.logs state zero when it first starts. So when you're developing games with phaser, make sure to have your developer tools open because the console is where you'll get the error messages. Now let's add an event listener. So in our create function, we can say game.input.keyboard.addKey. And here is where you put the key code. So each key on your keyboard has a specific key code. Phaser makes it easy so you don't have to remember the key code for each key on your keyboard. You can just type phaser.keyboard. And then the name of your key. So if I wanted to get the key code of A, I could type in phaser.keyboard.a, key code 65. But I want the key code for 1, so I would just type in 1. And that gives me 49. So instead of typing out 49, I think it makes more sense to just type out phaser.keyboard.1 because that way you'll know that this event listener is for the one key instead of writing 49, which you would have to remember that it represents one. Next, we want to say on down dot add parentheses, the name of the function, change state, which we haven't made yet, null, null, and then the argument, which will be the arguments passed to this function, which is a callback function in this case. The second and third argument are the listener context and the priority, which you can read more about in the phaser documentation. So let's make a function change state. And this function takes a state number or state num. And all this function does is it starts a new state. Save our code, refresh our local server. Actually, it's lowercase k. And the argument here should be one, actually. So when we press on the one key, phaser will call the change state function and it will pass one as the argument. Save our code, refresh our local server. And when I press one, we get an error. And that's because phaser has this weird thing where the callback functions are called with another argument. And that's like the event object. So it carries all the information of what just happened. So we have to have another parameter. And let's just console.log what the first argument is. Refresh our local server. Let's press one and we switch states. And we could tell because it says state one and C dot key is the first argument. And it has a bunch of information of what key you pressed, how long you pressed it for, etc. It's kind of useless in my opinion because we have the phaser framework doing a lot of the work for us, but this might have certain applications. So now we have an event listener. So when we press one, we switch to state one. So now let's add another event listener and let's have it for a key two. Refresh our code. And if I want to go to state two, I press two, it brings me to state two. However, if I press one, I don't go back to state one. That's because event listeners in phaser are local to the state that they were made in. So if I wanted to switch states when I'm not in state zero, I would have to add an event listener in that state. So let's just copy this code and let's paste it in state one.js. Refresh our local server. Actually, let's have this be for the zero key and pass it zero as its argument, save our code. And let's copy and paste this into state one, save our code, refresh our local server. And now I can switch between state one and state zero. So keep in mind that event listeners are local to the state that they were made in, meaning that they only apply in that state, but functions are global as long as you declare them this way and not declaring them inside of your state object. So this is kind of repetitive. Instead of having to write an event listener for each key in each state, let's make a function that will add all of the event listeners for keys zero through nine and run that function in each state. But before that, let's make a function called add key callback and it will take the key or the key that you press down, the function that will be called and the arguments that will be passed to that function. And then we could just copy and paste this line of code, put it there, replace this with key and replace that with args and replace this with function. Don't forget to indent your code. It makes your code easier to read. So let's call our add key callback function in our create function. Our first argument is the key. So let's say phaser dot keyboard dot zero. The function will be change state and our argument will be zero. And we can delete this line of code, save our code, refresh our local server. I'm getting another error. Oh, this time keyboard is capitalized. Save our code, refresh our local server, and let's switch to state one. And if I press zero, 
we go back to state zero. So now we have a function, add key callback, that adds an event listener to whatever key you specify it. So let's add an event listener for keys zero through nine. Save our code, refresh our local server, and now I'm gonna press eight, and now I am in state eight. So remember, event listeners are local to the state that they were made in. So let's make a function that will add the event listeners, and we'll call that function in each state. So let's call that function add change state event listeners. It takes no arguments, and let's just cut and paste that code in here, and just call our function that we just made. Save our code, refresh our local server. I'm gonna press four, I'm in state four. So now let's call this function in each state. Save all of our code, refresh our local server. And actually I'm gonna delete that console.log here because we don't need it. And now I can switch between each state by just pressing the keys. I think now's a good time to change the background color of each state so it's even easier to tell which state you're in. Let's save our code, refresh, and now we can tell which states that we're in. So state zero could be like your loading state. State one could be your menu state. State two could be like your game state, or level one. State three could be level two. You know, a state is basically a scene in your game. So now I think it's a good time to push our code to GitHub. Remember to change to the correct directory. And let's go back to GitHub. And there we go. Now all of our code is up to date on GitHub. Now that we've written a lot of code, it's a good time to push our code to GitHub. So open up your terminal, or iTerm. Let's change directories to phaser demo. And because the folder's on our desktop, we first have to say desktop, and then forward slash, and then phaser demo. And if we print out the working directory, we can see that we are now at phaser demo. To go back to your root directory, you can just type cd and it brings you back to your root directory. Now let's say we were at our desktop directory, like so. To go to our phaser demo directory, because we're already on our desktop, we can just type cd phaser demo. And now we are at the correct directory. So because we already set up a git repo on our computer and on GitHub, we don't have to link our repository in our command. And actually, we can just do the following commands to push our code to our repo. So let's start off with git add dash dash all. That adds all our files to our commit. git commit dash m, and m stands for message. So let's add a message. Enter. And now we can just do git push. And if we go to GitHub and refresh the page, we can see now that we have pushed all of our code to our GitHub repository. Part of having a fun game is having a game that can be played on all screen sizes. So if you notice, when I resize the window, our game screen does not resize. We can use something in Phaser called the Scale Manager to fix this issue. So if we go to state zero and just type game.scale.scale mode equals phaser.scale manager dot show underscore all save our code refresh our local server and now we can see that our game will resize depending on the size of our window another thing to keep in mind another thing to notice is that when you set the scale mode of your game that carries on to all of your other states so right now we are in state zero and you can see that it resizes if we switch to state five it also resizes now's a good time to make our game world bigger and i'll explain why in a few moments so if we go to main.js Let's make our game world bigger, and let's make it 1500 by 1000. Save our code, refresh our local server, and it looks pretty similar, right? The reason why we want to have a big game world is that it will make our images crisper or less, or less blurry. So if you can imagine, the actual size of our game world should be about this big. But because we are shrinking it down, it will reduce the blur of our images. So the scale mode that we used was show all. But there's also four other scale modes, 
exact fit, no scale, resize, and user scale. You can play around with the scale modes on this line if you want to see how they behave, but I think show all is the one you'll like the most. So that's how to use Phaser's scale manager. You may have noticed that after setting our scale mode, to show all, we have this annoying horizontal scroll in our window. And that's because there's this strip of space called the margin. And I won't go too much in detail, but margin represents space on a web page. So here you can see that we have a margin of eight pixels. So to fix this, we can add a CSS file. So make a new file and call it main.css. And now we have to link our CSS file in our index.html file. So to do so, we have to use a link tag. And this tag doesn't require a closing tag. But it does require two attributes, and those are rel or relationship. And this attribute tells the index.html file that this is a style sheet or it's going to be a CSS file. And now we have to link our CSS file with a href attribute. And let's say main.css. And now we're linking our main.css file to this web page. So let's go to our main.css file, and we have to select something on our web page. So we can just select everything with the asterisk and then add curly brackets. And between the curly brackets will be the CSS that we'll be applying to our select. And in this case, our selector selects everything. Selectors are out of the scope for this lesson, but just Google CSS selectors if you'd like to learn more. So remember that this white space is eight pixels of margin. So to remove it, we can just say margin colon zero and end it with a semicolon. Save our code. Refresh our local server. Forgot to save our index.html file. Refresh. And now we can see that we have no margin. And when I scroll, I don't have the scroll bar at the bottom of my screen. So now let's just push our code to GitHub. And there we go, we just pushed our code. Now we're gonna start adding images to our game. But before that, we need to make our images. Two of the best free resources for making images are Piskel and Sketchpad. So to start, let's go to piskelapp.com, log in, and just click Create Piskel. Here you can draw 8-bit images very easily because of the grid system that they have. You can pick from an array of colors, and you can also make your own custom color palette. You can also undo the last lines that you drew with Command-Z, or redo them with Command-Shift-Z. This button rotates your images. This one flips your images. They also have different tools for making rectangles, circles, filling in your shapes. And you can also make sprite sheets, which are useful for animation, but we'll get into sprite sheets later. So there are a lot of features in Piskel, and I won't be going over them. So just go to piskelapp.com and start creating images. And when you're done with your image, you can save it on the website and click Save Gallery, or you can export them and download them onto your computer by downloading the PNG. The next website is sketch.io. Once you're on sketch.io, click sketchpad. And this website is used for making more organic images or smoother images. So there are different writing heads. And again, you can change the color and undo all your lines or redo all your lines with command Z and command shift Z. And again, there are a lot of features on this website that I won't be going over. So just go to sketch.io and just play around with it. And when you're done with your drawing, just click export and make sure to set your format to PNG and just click download. Now we're going to start adding images and functionality to each state in our project. We'll start off with state 0. The end result will look like this. Okay, here's state 0. It's basically just a guy who can move around the screen with the arrow keys. Things to take note of are that he animates while he walks, and that our camera has a dead zone, so the camera will only follow our character when he's at this point on the screen, or if he's at this point of the screen. Otherwise, if he's between those two points, then the camera doesn't follow him. You'll also notice that he animates as he walks, and he stops animating when he's not walking. And he can also collide with the top of the road, as well as the bottom of the road, and the sides of our background. So that's state zero. So first you want to go to Piskel and make an image. This is one I made earlier. He's like a fatter version of Zelda, and I named him Adam but that's not important. But when you're finished making your image, you wanna resize it. So right now, our image is only 26 by 50 pixels. That's really small one compared to the size of our game world. Our game world is 1500 by 1000 pixels. So if we were to put this image in our game, we would have to scale it up and it would be very blurry. So with that being said, I'm gonna make my image 10 times bigger and make sure to have these two boxes checked when you resize your image. So I'll click resize. And now my image has been increased in size. 
When you're finished making your image, you want to save it to your gallery, and then you want to export it as a PNG. Now we have to add our image to our game. So first, we'll open up our phaser demo folder, create another folder called assets. And assets are the images and sounds that make up your game. In our assets folder, we want to make another folder, and let's call this sprites. Now we have to drag our file into our sprites folder. So make a new finder window with command N, click downloads. There's our file. Let's just drag it into our sprites folder. Now let's go back to brackets. And here we can see we have an assets folder. In our assets folder, we have a sprites folder. And there is our atom.png. So you'll notice there's this invisible box around our image. This can be problematic for several reasons. So to remove this white space, let's go back to where our image is in our folders, double click it. And now when I highlight it, we can see the invisible box. So let's just highlight the part of the picture that we want and click Command K. That crops our image. So now when I highlight my image, we can see that the excess invisible space has been cropped out. Let's save our file with Command S, close this. And now we can see that we have removed the invisible box. And now we're ready to add our image to our game. So let's go to state0.js and in our preload function, we can load our image. We can do so with game.load.image, parentheses. Our first argument will be the key for our image. So let's name our image Adam. And our second argument will be the path of where our image is. So our image is in assets, forward slash, sprites, forward slash, and then we find our atom.png file. Now that we've loaded our image, let's go to our create function and say game.add.sprite, Parentheses. And our first argument is the X position. So the width of our game world is 1500. And let's divide that by two to get the center of our width. And our height is 1000. Divide that by two. And our second argument will be our key for our image. Let's save our code, refresh our local server, and there's our image. Let's change the background so it's easier to see his hat. That's better you'll notice that our image isn't actually in the center of our game. That's because images are drawn from the top left corner. Also, it's important to know that the origin of our game, or the 0, 0 coordinate of our game, is in this corner. So if we draw our image at 0, 0, save our code, refresh our local server, we can see that our image is drawn in the top left corner. So let's draw our image back in the center of our game, and we're probably going to be using the center of our game multiple times. So let's create a variable that represents the center width and center height of our game world. Let's replace these with center X and center Y. Save our code, refresh our local server, and there we go. A JavaScript tip here is instead of typing out var to declare each variable, we can separate our variables and their values with commas, like so. So this line right here is the equivalent of these three lines. So to manipulate our sprite, which is just another word for an image in a game, we have to set our sprite to a variable. And let's just call him Adam and assign him that sprite. Now we can say adam.anchor.x equals 0.5, save our code, refresh. And now we can see that Adam is being drawn from the center of his image. And we can do the same for y. Save, refresh. And there we go. We can also write this in one line with the set to method. The first argument is x, and the second argument is y. Save, refresh your code, and there we go. Now let's add some functionality to our code by being able to move Atom with the arrow keys. So if we go back to phaser, this is the example that we looked at earlier. We can use the same implementation of if statements to change the position of our sprite. So pay attention to these two if statements. This one checks if the left arrow is down, and this one checks if the right arrow is down. When the left arrow is down, we are subtracting from the sprite's x position. And when the right arrow is down, we are adding to the sprite's x position. So let's go back to brackets. And in our update function, we'll use similar if statements. So if is down parentheses, and our argument will be phaser.keyboard dot right and remember this represents a key code we will change the x position of atom and add four to it save our code refresh and when i press my right arrow key we get an error and it says atom is not defined and this is relating to scope because we declared 
our atom variable inside our create function, we only have access to the atom variable inside this block of code. So let's delete var and declare atom up here. Save our code, refresh, and when I press my right arrow key, we can see that atom is moving. So let's change for to a speed variable and we'll create our speed variable up here. And now let's make an else if statement if we press the left arrow key. We also have to change the plus to a minus. So we move in the opposite direction, save our code, refresh, and now I can use the left arrow key. Let's do the same if and else if statements for vertical movement, except we'll replace a few letters. So let's make this up, down, and change X to Y. Save my code, refresh, and when I press the up arrow key, I go down. Because remember, our origin is up here in the top left corner. So when we add to our Y position, we're actually going down. So let's switch this plus sign for subtraction and this subtraction for plus. Save our code, refresh, and now I can move in all directions. We'll continue state zero in the next lesson, but for now, let's push our code to GitHub. And there we go. Okay, now we're gonna add a background, camera movement, and a tiny bit of physics in our game. So first, let's add a background image. Here's one I made on Piscol earlier. You can see that it's only 90 pixels wide by 32 pixels high. So again, we have to resize our image so it's bigger. Otherwise, if we just scale it up in our game, it'll be really blurry. So to resize, I'll just click resize. Make sure these two boxes are checked. And I know my height of my game is 1,000. So when I resize, it resizes the content. So now I'll just export it, download PNG, and then I'll go over to my phaser demo folder and let's add it in our assets folder. Let's create another folder called backgrounds and let's open up another finder window with command N, downloads. There's our background image. Let's drag it into backgrounds. And now let's load it into our game. So it's the same process as we did with Adam. We're just gonna copy this line right here, except we'll give it another key and we'll change the path of our image. So it's in the backgrounds folder and it is called tree BG or tree background. So there it is. So now that it's loaded, we can add the image in our create function. So because in this example, we won't be manipulating the tree background in the update function or with any event listeners, we can create a local variable within our create function. So we would only have access to that variable in this specific create function. So I'm just gonna call it var tree bg equals game dot add dot sprite. And again, sprite is just another word for an image. And since images are drawn from the top left corner, we can just specify its x position as zero, y position zero, and the key of the image. Save our code, refresh our local server, and there is our image. But obviously Adam isn't on our screen anymore. And that is because images are drawn on top of each other in the order in which they were defined. So these two lines is where I'm drawing Adam. But after these two lines, we are drawing the tree sprite on top of Adam. So if we just cut this line of code and paste it above where we drew our Adam image, save our code, refresh, we can see that Adam is now drawn on top of the background. So I think Adam is slightly too big for this background. So we can change the scale of our image with the following method. First, you say the variable name that represents the sprite, which in our case is Adam. So adam.scale.set2 parentheses. And our first argument will be the width scale. So if I say 0.7, the width of our image will be will be 70% of its actual width. And let's do the same with height. Save our code, refresh, and now Adam is slightly smaller. So now we have a background that we can move around on. Let's just increase the speed by two because I think he's moving a little slow. That's better. Okay, so you'll notice that our camera doesn't follow our image. We can go to the phaser documentation and find an example that does what we're looking for. So here's an example of camera movement and it uses something called a dead zone. So when you're in this rectangle, you do not move the camera. But as soon as you go outside of the rectangle or on the edge, 
you can see that the camera will move with the character. And now we can just look at the documentation. And it looks like these two lines are what makes the camera follow the character. So let's go back and add those two lines. So here we can say game.camera.follow parentheses and the variable that represents our sprite, which in our case is Adam. We save our code, refresh, and our camera doesn't follow our sprite. And that is because we haven't set the bounds of our game. In other words, the camera in our game doesn't have a reference point of where it should be. So to add the bounds of our game, we can use this line of code, game.world.setBounds, parentheses, and then the x and y coordinates of where our bounds of our game is, and then the width and height, which in our case, which in our case is 2813, because that's how wide our background image is, and it's 1000 pixels high. So let's save our code, refresh, now we can see that our camera can follow our sprite. So now let's add the dead zone. So our camera only moves when our atom image is on the edge of this invisible rectangle that we want. So again, we can just look at the documentation and its source code. They're using this line, so we'll use the same with the arguments changed out, of course. So let's say game.camera.deadzone equals new phaser dot rectangle parentheses. And for this example, we want our camera to be 600 pixels wide. So about this wide. So our first argument will be the origin of where our rectangle is drawn. So let's say center X or the center of our game world minus 300 because our dead zone is 600 pixels wide. So when we subtract 300 from where our rectangle is being drawn, it's going to be drawn in the center of our game. We also want our rectangle to be drawn from the top. So let's just have zero as the y position which again is up here on the top of the screen and now the width of a rectangle and the height of a rectangle and it's a thousand because that's how tall our game screen is so let's save our code refresh and now you can see we have a dead zone so there are a few things missing and one of them is our character should face the other side when it goes left and there's an easy way to solve this issue and we can do that with scale. We can actually just set our x value for our scale as a negative number. So if I make this negative 0.7, save my code, refresh, you can see that Adam's facing the opposite direction. So now with that in mind, we can just take this line of code, copy it, and just paste it in our if statements so that when we are pressing on the right arrow, Adam faces the actual direction of his image. And when we press the left arrow, we will set the scale x of our atom image to its inverse value. So let's save our code, refresh, and now when I go right, we're facing right, and when we go left, he's facing left. So the last issue we're going to cover in this video is the game bounds. So you can see that we have a character that goes out of bounds, and that's not what we want. We want to have our character stay on the screen. So to fix that, we have to add physics to our game. So whenever you're going to use physics in phaser, the first line of code in your create function should be initializing the specified physics engine. So we're going to be using arcade physics. So to initialize the arcade physics engine, we can just say game.physics.start system parentheses and our argument will just be phaser.physics.arcade and arcade is in all caps. So now that we have our physics initialized in our game, we can add physics to a specified image. We can add physics to a specified image. So we can just say game.physics.enable parentheses and then the variable that represents our sprite, which is Adam. And then below that, to make our Adam image collide with the bounds of our game world, we can just say bounds and set this value to true. Save our code, refresh, and when we go to the edge of our game, we can see that we are colliding with it. Same with the bottom, as well as the right side of our game. So the last thing we're gonna add is some kind of collision with the road right here, because you can see that Adam can actually jump really high and just levitate in the air, and that's not what we want. We just want Adam to be able to walk on the road, like in this area. So one way to fix this problem is to just add an if statement in our update function that just says, if Adam is above this point, keep him there. 
So let's see what the y position of our image is when Adam is around this area. We can get that value with just Adam dot y and our value and his y position right now is 394. So now in our if statement that checks if we're pressing on the up arrow key, we can just add another if statement inside. And this one checks if Adam dot y is less than 395. And if Adam's y position is less than 395, like it is here, we'll just we'll just set Adam's y position to 395. Save our code, refresh, and now when I go to the top of the road, we can see that he is stuck at this point. Okay, now we're gonna add animation to our Adam image, and then we'll be done with state zero. Here's an animation that I created earlier. So in Piscal, they allow you to create frames of an animation. And if you'll notice, each frame is slightly different than the frame before that. And if you play these frames very quickly, you get the effect of motion. And if I wanted to make my animation more smooth, I would just add more frames. And the difference between each frame would be even less. So after you're done with your animation, you want to resize it. And you want to make sure that these two boxes are checked. And I'll just make my image 10 times bigger, resize. And then I'll export it. And then over in our assets folder, we'll create another folder and call it sprite sheets. Open up another finder window with command N. Go to downloads. There's our image. I'm going to rename it Adam sheet because it's a sprite sheet. And we already have another image called Adam.png. So it's good to name your files differently. And let's just drag this PNG into our sprite sheets folder. So if we take a look at our sprite sheet, we can see that it is each frame that we had and Piscal automatically glues each frame to each other so that each frame is the exact same width. So let's go back to brackets. And instead of loading an image for Adam, we'll load a sprite sheet and don't forget to change the path. And then you have to add a third and fourth argument and that will be the width and height of each frame in your sprite sheet. So our image is 240 pixels wide by 370 pixels high. So let's just put those numbers here, 240 wide by 370 high. Save our code, refresh, and we can see that our image looks exactly the same. That's because when you load a sprite sheet and you add that image to the game, it will first default to the first frame in your sprite sheet. So how do we add animation? Well, there's this example on Phaser, and it's exactly what we want. So when we look at the source code, it looks like they're creating an animation where they state the name of the animation. So this animation is called walk. And then they are listing the order of the frames in which the animation is played. And then to start playing the animation, they just use the animations.play method. So let's use similar code in our state zero. So here, let's create a animation called walk. So we start off with adam.animations.add parentheses, and then the key of our animation, which we'll call walk, and then the order of our frames, which will be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So now that we have an animation called walk, we can play it when we move left or right. So in, in our if statements that check if you press the right or left arrow key, we'll just say play parentheses, and then the key of our animation, which is walk. And then our second argument will be the frame rate. So that could be anything from zero to 60. So let's just say 14. And then our third argument will be if our animation loops. And because we are walking, we want to loop because it's a constant cycle of moving your left leg and then your right leg. But if you were making an animation for something like shooting a bow and arrow once, you would have this set to false, unless your character had a rapid fire bow and arrow where you would keep on looping the animation. So let's just copy this line of code and paste it in our if statement that checks we press the left arrow key, save our code, refresh, and now we can see that we have animation. But you'll notice that our animation keeps on going even when we're not moving. So to fix this, we can just call the stop method. So if we're not pressing on the right arrow key or the left arrow key, we'll default to this else statement and say adam.animations.stop parentheses, and then the key of our animation, and that stops the animation from playing. So if we save our code, refresh, we can see that when we stop walking, our animation stops. But you'll notice it is stuck in the last frame that was displayed while the walk animation was still playing. So to fix this, we can just set the frame of our sprite sheet to zero, because the first frame, or index zero, is just standing. So we can just type atom.frame equals zero, 
save our code, refresh, and now when we stop walking, he always stops in the first frame, which is standing. And that's it, you just finished state zero. Now's a good time to push my code to GitHub. So we'll just open terminal, cd, and here's a trick that I haven't taught yet. Instead of typing out the path of where your directory is, you can just type out cd and then space, and then you can just drag your folder into the terminal and it writes the path for you. Enter, and you can see that I'm at phaser demo. Let's go over to GitHub. And it looks like we successfully pushed our code. Now we're gonna start working on state one. The final result will look something like this. So this is state one. We have a tile map and our atom image that can move on the screen. He can collide with the rocks and the dark patches of grass. And you could see that we are console.logging what we're hitting when we collide with either the rocks or the dark patches of grass. So before we start coding, let me change the theme of my text editor so that it's dark. It's just easier on the eyes, in my opinion. And now I'm going to make our code less redundant. So if you'll notice, in each state, we're saying we're console.logging the state number, and that's really redundant. So instead of console.logging the number of the state at the beginning of each state in the create function, let's just console.log in our change state function. So I can just say console.log and then state plus state num. Save my code, refresh. Okay, so now we are getting to console.log, so we know it's working. And now let's just delete our console.logs for our state numbers. Save our code, refresh, and everything seems to be working. Now a small issue here is that when we first refresh our game, it doesn't print out state zero, but that's okay if we don't get state zero printed out at the beginning. It's nothing too important. Okay, now let's start working on state one. So to create a tile map, you have to download the tiled tile map editor. So if you just go to mapeditor.org, just download it for whatever operating system you have. And once you have that installed, you can start making tiles. So here's some tiles I made. They're just some kind of grass. So the standard for tile size in tile maps is 32 pixels wide by 32 pixels high. But you could have any size tile that you want. Just be sure that it's a perfect square. So this will be its own tile and this will be its own tile. So let me just export this. And you'll see that we just get a sprite sheet, but the tiled map editor will split this image in half. So you don't have to worry about having a different file for each tile. The tiled map editor will automatically break up the images. So here's another tile that I'm gonna put on my tile map, except this one's 96 by 96. And that's important because 96 is a multiple of 32, which will be the size of our tiles. And again, we can just export this, put it in the tiled map editor, and tiled will automatically break up our image into nine tiles because 96 is three times 32. So I'll just export this. And now let's go to our phaser demo folder and go to our assets folder, make another folder, and let's call it tile maps. Then make another finder window with command N, go to downloads, and let's just drag our two images to our tile maps folder. Okay, now let's open up tiled and let's create a new tile map. And when you make a new map, make sure that the orientation is orthogonal. So we have square tiles. The tile layer format is CSV and not base64 encoded because Phaser doesn't support base64 encoded tile maps. And then you can just set the height and width of your tile map to whatever you'd like. And our tiles are 32 pixels wide by 32 pixels high. So this is correct. And let's just click OK. And now, now we're going to add our tile set images. So let's say we don't have any of these side toolbars here. We can just bring them back with view. And let's select tile sets because that's what we're going to be. That's what we're going to be adding. Now let's bring up our folder with our tile set images. And just drag them in. So this tile set will be called rock tiles. All this information is correct, so I'll just click OK. And you can see that it automatically breaks up our image into nine tiles. Now let's add our grass tiles. Click 
click OK. And now we have our grass tiles. So one thing to keep in mind is that you can't add images to your tile set. All the tiles for a specific tile set have to be on one image file. So I can't make another rock on Piskel and then add it to my rock tiles tile set. I would have to create another tile set up here. So let's just add some grass. So I'll just select this tile, click the bucket, or the shortcut is F for fill. And then I'll just add the grass to my tile map, I'll zoom out, and I'll add some more grass, except I'll use the stamp brush and just add it wherever. And I'll add some rocks. So I can just highlight this entire image and then just put it wherever I want to. Except you'll notice that our grass tiles here are gone and that we can see past the rock. So what we have to do here is add another layer. So I'll just undo what I just did with Command Z and then I'll bring up my layers sidebar. So now I can see I have one layer. I'll actually just name it grass and then I'll add another layer and call it rocks. And so now that I have my rocks layer highlighted, whenever I add an image, I'm adding to the rock layer. And I could also deselect the grass layer to show me whatever's on a specific layer. And I'll just add some more rocks. Okay, I think my tile map is finished now. So now we're gonna export it. So before we do that, let's open up our map properties sidebar. And it's really important that the layer format is CSV because again, Phaser doesn't support Base64 or XML. And now let's save our project with Command S. Let's just name this field, save it. So now we have it on our desktop. And now let's export it. Export as, and export it as a JSON file. And save. Now we can see that we have a field.json file on our desktop. Okay, now that we've created our tile map and we've exported it as a JSON file, let's add it to our game. So let's put our JSON file in our tile maps folder. So now we can see that we have our JSON file in our tile maps folder. So now we have to load our tile map with game.load.tile map parentheses. Our first argument will be the key for our tile map, then the path, and then null which isn't important for right now, but basically it's a JSON object that you could pass to it, but it's not important. And the last argument is phaser.tilemap.tiled underscore JSON. And the reason why we have to add this line right here is because the default is a CSV file. So we have to let phaser know that we're gonna be using a JSON file. After that, we have to load our tile set images. So we can just say game.load.image parentheses, and then the name of our tile set, so grass tiles, because if you look at our tiled map editor, we have a grass tiles tile set and a rock tiles tile set. So we have to say grass tiles, and then the path for our tile set image. And let's do the same for our rock tiles tile set. So that loads our tile map and our tile set images. So now let's add it to our game. So let's create a variable called map, and this will represent our tile map. Now let's say game.add.tile map and then the key for our tile map now we have to add our tile set images with map dot add tile set images parentheses actually there's no s and then we say the key of our tile set image and we can do the same for rocks and now we have to add the layers to our tile map so let's create a variable for each layer with map dot create layer parentheses and then the name of our layer which in our case is grass and rocks. So let's add the grass layer first and do the same for rocks. Save our code, refresh our local server, and when we go to state one, there's our tile map. So one thing that's worth noting is that like sprites, our layers are drawn in the order that they were created. So if we created the rocks layer first and then the grass layer, we don't see the rocks anymore because what's happening here is we're drawing the rocks, but then we're using the grass layer and drawing over the rocks. So keep that in mind that the order of creating your layers matters. So just to review, first we have to load our tile map. And because we exported it as a JSON file, you have to say that it's a JSON file, otherwise Phaser will default to a CSV file. And then we have to add our tile set images. And then we have to create a tile map. And then we have to say that we are going to have a tile map. 
then we have to add the tile set images, and then we have to add the layers. So that's how you add your tile map to your phaser project. Okay, now let's add a character to state one so that our character can move around in our tile map and collide with the rocks. So let's just use our atom image. So here I'm just loading our atom.png file. Now let's create a atom variable and set it to that image. And let's put them somewhere on our map. There's our image. And if you're wondering why I don't have to say var atom, it's because in state zero, we've already declared our atom variable. And so when we just switch to a different file, this variable atom carries on to whatever file that you switch to. So let's make our atom image smaller with atom.scale.set to. Okay, that's better. Now let's add physics to our game with game.physics.start system parentheses phaser physics dot arcade. And one thing to take note of is that when you start physics in your game, that physics carries on to the following states. So this line right here that I just wrote is redundant because we, we already started our physics in state zero. But if this were a separate project, then you would have to start the physics like so. Now let's add physics to our atom variable with game dot physics dot enable parentheses and then atom. And now let's add some input so that when we press on the arrow keys, atom moves. So instead of saying game.input.keyboard.isdown, etc., we can use something called cursors so you don't have to write all that stuff down. So let's create a global variable called cursors and let's set cursors to game.input.keyboard.createCursor keys, parentheses. So this creates keys for our up, down, left, and right arrow keys. So in our update function, we can just say if cursors dot up or whatever direction that you want dot is down and then we could change the y position of our atom sprite so let's save our code and when i press the up arrow key he goes down and that's because i have this switched around it's supposed to be negative okay there we go but we want our atom image to collide with the rocks and part of that is instead of changing the position of our sprites this way we have to use velocity so after we enable physics on our atom variable, we can use velocity with atom.body.velocity.y, and then we could set the velocity to whatever number. So I'm gonna create a variable called vel or velocity, and then I'm going to set it to 500. Save our code, refresh. Okay, he's moving fast enough. So this should actually be negative. Now let's add input for the rest of our arrow keys. Save our code, refresh. Now we have our character moving in all directions. And actually, our character doesn't stop, so we have to add an else statement, where if our up and down arrow keys are not pressed, then our Y velocity should be zero. Take that code and then set our Y velocity to zero. And then we'll do the same for X, except change Y for X. Save, refresh, go to state one and looks like everything's working fine. Okay, now let's add collision between Adam and the rock tiles. So first, let's say map.set collision between, and then parentheses. And this part's kind of tricky because now we have to know what the index of our colliding tiles are. So let's open our JSON file and we can see that here we have our rock layer and anywhere that says zero, that means there's no tile put down. But you could see that we have the numbers one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I get the feeling that indexes one through nine represent the rock tiles. And if we go up here where we can see the grass layer, we can see that there are tens and elevens. So I get the feeling that the tens represent this kind of grass tile and the 11s represent the darker shade of grass tile. So with that in mind, let's go back to our state1.js file. And the rock tiles ranged from indexes 1 to 9. And our third argument will be true because it's a boolean that says if collisions are enabled or not. And our fourth argument will be the layer that will have the collision, which is rocks. And then in our update function, we have to check for collision between our atom variable and the rock 
tiles. So we can say game.physics.arcade.collide parentheses. And then we're going to collide atom with our rocks layer. So we actually have to have rocks a global variable. Save our code, refresh. And now you can see that we collide with our rock tiles. And if you want, you can add a callback function for, so that when we hit our rock layer, we console.log something. And this thing right here is called an anonymous function. It's basically just the function without a name. So let's save our code, refresh. And now whenever we hit rocks, we get hitting rocks in our console. Also, it's important to notice that at the beginning of our state, we're on top of our rocks. Even though we should be colliding with them, it's only after we leave the rocks or stop being on top of them when we can actually collide with the rocks. So that's just a kind of physics behavior to take note of. So previously, Phaser didn't support multiple collision layers, but now you can. So let's say I wanted to collide with the darker patches of grass. I can just set the collision for one tile index. So I can just say map.set collision parentheses. And then I believe the index for our darker patches of grass was 11. And then I'll just set this collision for the grass layer and then check for collisions for our grass layer in our update function. We also have to make grass a global variable. Let's change this to grass, save our code, refresh. And now I can collide with the rocks and I could also collide with the darker patches of grass at least. And that concludes state one. So now let's push our code to GitHub. And there we go, we just pushed our code to GitHub. So one thing to mention about collisions and phaser physics is that if you want your sprite to collide with something, you have to use velocity because if we just used what we did in state zero, where we just said atom.y minus equal some value, save our code, refresh, that is not the same as giving an object velocity. So if I go up, you can see that we don't collide. But when I go in any other direction, because we're setting the velocity and we're not changing the position like this, we can collide with things. So that's just something to keep in mind. Now we're going to work on state two. The end result will look something like this. So here's state two. All it is is a shooting example where if you hold down on the mouse, you can automatically fire bullets with no limits. And you can also shoot the sprites and they will kill themselves. So one thing to point out is that this sprite right here is just a regular sprite. We're using game.add.sprite, but these three sprites right here, these are part of a phaser group. So we are not making three separate variables for each of these sprites, which is useful if you have a lot of enemies. And that's pretty much it. So to start, let's preload our images. And these are just images that I made on Piskel. So now let's add the base to the center of our screen. And now we have to set the anchor and the scale of it. Okay, that's good. Now let's add the barrel of the cannon. And again, we have to set the anchor and scale of our sprite. Okay, all looks good. Now we're gonna make the barrel rotate to wherever our mouse is pointing. So in our update function, we're going to set the rotation of our barrel to game.physics.arcade.angle to pointer, and our argument will be barrel. But because we are using barrel outside of the create function, we have to make barrel a global variable. So at the top, I'll just say var barrel. So that way you can use the barrel variable anywhere in our code. Save our code, refresh, and there we go. Now we're gonna make our cannon fire bullets. So let's make a bullets variable. And in our create function, we are going to make bullets a group. So we'll say bullets equals game.add.group parentheses. And groups are useful if you're gonna have many sprites that are very similar to each other. In our case, it's bullets. Now let's enable a body on our bullets. Set the physics of our bullets to arcade. 
And now let's add 50 bullets to our group. So let's say bullets.create multiple. And our first argument is how many we want to add. So let's add 50. And then the second argument is the sprite, which is bullet, or the key of our sprite, which is bullet. Now let's make a fire function. And we'll call this function whenever we click our mouse. And for now, let's just console.log firing. And in our update function, let's check if game.input.active pointer dot is down, we are going to call our fire method. So let's save our code, refresh, and whenever I click, you can see that our fire function is being called. So now let's add our bullets to our fire function. So we're going to make a variable called bullet, and we are going to set bullet to the first dead bullet in our bullets group. So we'll say bullets.get first dead, and we are going to reset bullet to the location of our cannon, which is at the center of the screen. So we'll say bullet.reset, and we'll just say barrel.x and barrel.y. And to make our bullet move towards wherever we clicked our mouse, we're going to say game.physics.arcade.move to pointer. And we're going to make bullet move. And our first argument is the sprite that we want to have move towards the pointer. And our second argument is the speed. So let's make a variable called velocity. And I'll just set velocity to 1,000. Save our code, refresh. And now when I click, you can see that we have bullets but it's a burst of bullets and then right after we fire more than 50 bullets we get an error and we'll fix this error in a moment but first let's fix the rotation of our bullet so we can just say bullet dot rotation equals game dot physics dot arcade dot angle to pointer and then we'll get the angle of the bullet to wherever our pointer is save our code refresh oh i'm actually forgetting a t And there we go. Now our bullets are facing in the correct orientation. So now let's fix this issue of having a limited amount of bullets that we can fire. So one way to fix this is we can set every member in the bullets group to kill itself once it leaves the bounds of our world. So first, we have to say bullets.setAll. And for every bullet in our bullets group, we are going to set the check world bounds property and it has to be in quotes and we're going to set that to true and then we have to set the out of bounds kill property to true so let's save our code refresh and now we can fire more than 50 bullets so if i had so what just happened right now was that we have 50 bullets on the screen so in our case, when we have 50 bullets on the screen, there are no bullets that are dead. It's only after the bullets leave the bounds of the world where the bullets will kill itself, so it will be dead. And then get first dead, we'll get the first dead bullet in our bullets group, and it will reset that bullet to the center of our barrel. So we can fix this issue by one, either adding a lot of bullets to our bullets group. So if I say 500, we won't run out of bullets and we won't get our error that says we can't reset our bullet. The second option is to limit the amount of bullets that you can fire or limit the firing rate of your cannon. So the way we can do this is we can have an if statement that checks for the time that you last fired a bullet and it will check if that time is greater than the desired firing rate. So let's just make an if statement and put all of this inside the if statement and we are going to make a global variable called next fire and we're going to set that to zero and we're also going to make a fire rate variable and we're going to set that to 200 and then in our if statement we are going to set next fire to game dot time dot now and then we're going to add fire rate to it and then between the parentheses we're going to check if game dot time dot now is greater than next fire. Save our code, refresh, and now we have a limited firing rate. So what's happening here is game.time.now is how long the game has been running for. So if I type it out right now, you can see that we've been playing for about 22 seconds because 
This number is in milliseconds. So every time we fire, we are setting next fire to the amount of time played plus fire rate. And what this number represents is the time that you are allowed to fire. Because if game.time.now is less than next fire or the time that you're allowed to fire, we won't fire a bullet. So now let's clean things up. So we don't need 500 bullets in our bullet group. And you'll also notice that our bullets are being drawn on top of our cannon barrel and they're slightly offset. So first, let's draw the bullets underneath the cannon barrel. And we can simply do that by switching up the order in which we draw the sprites. So first, we're going to draw the base of the cannon, and then we're going to draw the bullets, and then we're going to draw the barrel of the cannon. Save our code, refresh, and now our bullets are being drawn underneath our cannon barrel. And now we're going to set the anchor of our bullets and the scale so that they render properly and it looks like they're coming out of the cannon barrel. So to do that, we can just say bullets.setAllAnchor.y and we're going to set that to 0.5. Save our code, refresh. So that centers our bullet. And we don't have to set the anchor.x of our bullet because all we care about is drawing the bullet from the center of its height. And now let's set the scale of our bullet of our bullets group. So let's say bullets.setAll and set scale x. And we're gonna set it to 0.85. And let's do the same for y. And there we go. Now I don't think you can set scale just by itself to 0.5. So it looks like it doesn't work. So you can't use scale and set all. You have to state if it's dot x or dot y. Okay, now we're gonna add enemies so that we could shoot them with our bullets. So first, let's make a enemy variable and let's just set that variable to a sprite with game.add.sprite and we'll just use the atom image from state zero. So there he is. Now let's enable physics on our enemy with game.physics.enable enemy. And then in our update function, we wanna check if bullet is overlapping with enemy. And if so, we will call a function. So to do that, we can just say game.physics dot arcade dot overlap and the first two arguments will be the two sprites that we want to have overlap so that will be the bullets group and the enemy and the third argument will be the callback function that will be called when these two sprites overlap so i'm going to make a method called hit enemy and for now we will just console.log hit Okay, so now in state two, we can see that whenever a child of the bullets group overlaps with enemy, it console.logs hit. So now what we have to do is we have to kill the enemy sprite and the bullet sprite. So to do that, we have to make bullet a global variable. So that way you can use the bullet variable anywhere in the code. And then in our hit enemy function, and then in our hit enemy method, we will just say enemy.kill, and then we will just kill the bullet variable. Save our code, refresh, and there we go. So now let's add a group of enemies to shoot, because sometimes when you have a lot of enemies in your game, it's better to use groups rather than creating a variable for every enemy. So to start, let's create a, another global variable called enemy group and we will set enemy group to a group with game.add.group and then we'll say enemy group dot enable body to true and that will allow the enemy group to use physics and then we'll set the enemy group physics body type to phaser dot physics dot arcade and arcade is supposed to be in all caps so this is just saying we're going to use the enemy group is going to use arcade physics and now let's just create a for loop to create the enemies. So to create an enemy, we can just use enemy group dot create. The first two arguments will be the X and Y, will be the X and Y position of that child in the group. And then the third argument will just be the image to use for that child. So let's save our code, refresh. Nope, I forgot to write an I. It's supposed to be a lowercase h. Okay, so there we go. So the bullets and the enemy group aren't colliding, but that's because we haven't coded that yet. But for now, let's change the size of the enemies in the enemy group. So I'll just say enemy group dot set all. And what set all will do is it will set the specified property 
for each child in the enemy group to whatever value you want. So let's just change the anchor for each child. And now let's set the scale for each one. Okay, so that's better. And then in our update function, we can just use the same line, but instead of enemy, we will say enemy group. And then we will make another method called hit group. And because this is a group that we are checking for overlap, we have to specify what we want to kill. So I'll just give this method two arguments, b and e for bullet and enemy. And let's just say b.kill and e. Save our code, refresh. And looks like everything's working. So the reason why we have to say b.kill in the hit group method, but we don't have to make a bullet argument in our hit enemy method is because the arguments that are passed to the hit group method will come in the order of these arguments. So if we switch these around, we can just give this method one argument, which is E, and then we can just use the bullet variable instead of B. So if we save our code, refresh, everything works fine. So that concludes state two. Now we're going to work on state three. The end result will look something like this. So this is state three. All it is is these three buttons. And things to take note of are that they tint and untint when you press and let your mouse up. And things to take note of are that they make sounds when you press and unpress them. So that's what they sound like. And the one and two buttons can go to state one and state two. And that's pretty much it. So to start, I've already preloaded three button images. So now we can just add a button to our screen with game.add.button parentheses. And then the first two arguments will be the X and Y position of our button. And then the third argument will be the key of our image, which is in our case, button one. And then the fourth argument will be a callback function, which will be called whenever you press the button. So we can just use an anonymous function for this example. And let's just call the change state function that we made back in state zero. And the first argument should be null and the second argument should be the number of the state. So if we save our code, refresh, and look at state three, there's a button. And when we click on it, we go to state one. So I'm gonna make another button and it's just going to be button two and it switches to state two. There we go. And I'll make a third button that just does nothing for now at least. So we can just delete this callback function. So one thing we could add to these buttons is to make them more interactive. So an example of that would be for the button to change when you press down on it and then go back to its previous state when your mouse is up. So let's make a tint method, and then we'll just change the tint of the button that calls it. So we'll say this dot tint equals zero X and then six Bs. And this is basically just a hex color. So the first two characters after the X is how much red is in the tint. The third and fourth are green and the last two are blue. So let's change the tint of button three whenever you press down on it. So to do so, we can just say b3, b3 dot on input down dot add. And then we'll say this dot tint, which is the function we'll be calling when input is down. And then the second argument is the context, which is button three. So let's save our code, refresh, and then the tint of our button changes. So let's add this feature to the other two buttons so that all the buttons can tint. And now let's make a untint function so that when you, so that when your mouse is up, the button removes its tint. So this color right here is just pure white and this is slightly, and this is, and this is like a gray. So to make our buttons untint, we can just say on input up instead of on input down. And then let's change tint to untint. And now our buttons can tint and untint. Now let's add some sounds to our buttons so that when you press down on them, they make one sound. And then when you let your mouse up, they make another sound. So in my assets folder, I created another folder called sounds. And inside of it is just an MP3. And what it is, is just a series of sounds. So those are our two sounds that we're gonna use. And we don't have to have separate MP3 files for each sound in our game. We can just stitch all of those sounds into one file, and then we could break them up in phaser. So it's kind of like a sprite sheet, except for sounds. So in our preload function, we can just 
load a sound with game.load.audio, parentheses, and then we can just give the sound a key, just like our images, and then the path for our sound. Now that we have our sounds loaded, we can split them up into different segments. So let's make a variable called sound, and we will set sound in our create function to game.add.audio, parentheses, and then the key of our sound will be the argument. So now we can split up our sound file into different segments. We can do so with sound.addMarker, parentheses, and then the first argument will be the key for our sound. So we have a lower pitched pop and a higher pitched pop. So one key will be low and we'll make another marker for high. So add marker needs two more arguments and those are the start and end points of the sound segments. So, so my sound file is only a second long. So I'll just say the start is zero seconds and then the end is 0.5 for low. And then for high, we'll just say it's 0.5 to one second. And now to play the sounds, and now to play the sounds when we click on our buttons, we'll just say sound.play.low, and then our argument will be the key for our marker, which is low for when we press down on the button. And then we'll play high when our button is let up. So let's save our code, refresh. And now when we press on a button, it makes a sound. And when we let up, it makes another sound. So you might've noticed that there was a really long delay between pressing down on the button and the sound playing. And the same goes for letting the button up. And that's just because the, the endpoints for my sounds are not an exact fit. So actually for my sound file, the low pitched pop starts at 0.15 seconds approximately, and it probably ends at 0.3, but that doesn't really matter because there are no sounds immediately after the pop, so the endpoint doesn't really matter for my sound file. And then for the high-pitched pop, it actually starts at 1.1 and ends at maybe 1.3, but I'll just say 1.5 to be safe. So I'll save my code, refresh the local server, and now the sounds are a little more responsive. So that's state three. Now we're gonna start state four. The end result will look something like this. So this is state four. All it is is a bunch of examples of tweens. Here we can see that we are changing the values of these sprite objects. This one loops forever, and this one's opacity changes instead of its position, like all the other ones. And this guy will only tween once you call a function to make it start. So that's state four. So what this state will focus on are tweens. So essentially what a tween is, is a way to change a value from one point to another point in a certain amount of time using a certain pattern. And that pattern can be something like linear or bouncing, but I think it'll just make more sense if I just code it and show you. So to create a tween, what you would do would be game.add.tween and the tween method takes an object Usually it's a sprite, but it can be anything that has a numerical value. So let's say I want to tween this first atom image. So I'll say A1. And if I want to tween it to a certain position, I would just say dot two parentheses. And the two method takes an object. And this object will be the, will hold the properties that you want to tween to. So let's say I want to tween this guy to the Y position of 400. So next, our second argument will be the time it takes to go to this position of 400. So I'll say 2000 for two seconds. And then the third argument will be the pattern of my tween or the ease of my tween. And the most basic one would be linear. And the fourth argument will be true. And what this basically means is the tween will start automatically because by default, tweens do not auto start. So this would be false. So I'll just save my code, refresh, and there we go. So you'll notice that the sprite went from up here to down here in two seconds at the same speed. So we can change the ease of our tween by just changing the third argument. So if I wanted the tween to be a bouncing tween, I would just say bounce. And now he bounces. So to get the full list of tweens, I couldn't find it in the documentation but if you go to this URL or just search up phaser tweens, you could probably find this page. 
This, this is the source code of the tween manager in Phaser, and these are basically just all the tweens you can use. So if I wanted to use this one, I could just use that for my third argument. And now he has a different tween. So to better visualize what these tweens would look like, you can just Google for easings or just go to easings.net and it has the patterns of every tween. So the first one we had was linear, which is just a constant speed. And the one we have now is the ease out bounce. But when we just type out bounce, you can see that it's the same thing as bounce.ease out. So just play around with the tweens and see what ease you like. So let's make another tween. Except this time, we'll create a variable. So this is just stuff I had from earlier. So we'll make a variable i, and it's not a very good name, but whatever. We will set i to a tween. So I'll say game.add.tween atom2 to x100 and y to 0. So you can actually change multiple values in a tween by just creating an object with multiple properties. And we'll make this tween last one second, so 1,000. And our tween can be elastic ease out. And that should look like this guy. So I'll just put it there. And we're not going to have a fourth argument because this tween isn't going to auto start. So I'll just save my code, refresh. And now to start this i tween, we can just say i.start with parentheses. And there he goes. Now let's make another tween for the third atom image, except instead of using to, let's use from. So to and from are very similar. The only difference is to will tween your object to that certain value that you specify here. From will tween your value from the specified value to its actual value. So I'll just say from, and we will tween it from the y position of 1000, and this will take one and a half seconds and the tween we'll use will be circular ease out put it there and this will auto start so there we go it tweened from the y position of 1000 which is down here to 100. our fourth tween will change the anchor point of our fourth atom image so if we tween the fourth image and change its anchor value like so you'll notice that we get an error. And that's because for properties like these, you would put them here in the tween method and then change the x value like so. So a fifth argument that we could add is a delay. So I could delay this tween by one second. The sixth argument would be if the tween would repeat. So if I say true, you could see that it repeats twice. Or if you wanted to repeat the tween three times, you would say two. So it repeats twice after the first initial tween. And then our, and then a seventh and last argument would be if you want it to yo-yo. So if a tween yo-yos, that just means it reverses itself after it finishes its tween. So if we set this to true and run our code, you can see that it yo-yos back. Our fifth tween will change the alpha value of our atom image because tweens don't necessarily have to change the position of a sprite. They can change any numerical value in an object. So we'll change the alpha value or the opacity of our image to zero over one second using the bounce ease and it will automatically start. So there it goes. So two more tricks I'd like to show you. So if you want your tween to loop infinitely, you can just set the repeat argument to false. And at the end of the tween, you can just say loop parentheses and pass true as an argument. So now you'll notice that this guy right here will loop forever. So the last trick I'd like to show you would be Let's say you don't know where you're going to be tweening to or the value that you're going to be tweening to is always different. Instead of tweening to a number like this, we can just add to that value by putting plus or minus and the value that you want to add to the specified value. So pay attention to the first guy where we are going to add 400 to its Y position. 
So that concludes state four. Okay, now we're gonna work on state five and the end result will look something like this. So here's state five. All it is is a simple platformer where we have Adam and he can jump on top of these platforms. You'll notice that he can bounce when he hits the ground. And obviously there's vertical gravity but he also has acceleration, so it takes time for him to build up speed when I press on the left and right arrow keys. And that's pretty much it. So first I'm just going to preload an image. And that image will be of the platform that Adam will be jumping on. Next, let's add Adam to our game. So there he is. Next, let's enable physics on Adam. So we can just say game physics dot enable and Adam will be our argument after we add physics to Adam we can give him gravity with Adam dot body dot gravity equals 500 and we have to specify which direction the gravity is is occurring in so we'll give him vertical gravity so we're gonna use dot y because y is up and down so now he can fall down Next, let's make him collide with the bounds of the world. So now you can see that he collides with the world. And let's make Adam bounce a little bit when he hits the ground. So we can just say adam.body.bounce.y equals 0 0.3. So you can see that he bounces slightly when he hits the ground. And now let's just add some keyboard input so that we can move Adam around the world. So in the update function, I'm just going to make a few if statements that check if some arrow keys are being pressed down. So if we're pressing the left arrow key, we are going to add acceleration to Adam with Adam.body acceleration dot x and we'll make a variable called excel and it has to be negative because excel is going to be a positive number and then when we're pressing down on the right arrow key we'll just give him positive acceleration so when i press on the left arrow key he goes left and when i press the right arrow key he goes right and then if we're not pressing either the left or the right arrow key we'll just set his acceleration We'll just set his horizontal acceleration to zero. So right now I'm not pressing on the left arrow key, but you can see that Adam does not seem to slow down. So to make him slow down, we have to add drag to his body. So we'll just say adam.body.drag.x equals 400. So now he can slow down whenever I let down on the arrow keys. So now I'm just going to make another if statement so Adam can jump up. Except this time we'll just use velocity. Because when you give a sprite velocity, the sprite moves right away. But if you give the sprite acceleration, it's going to take time for the sprite to build up speed. So let's save our code, refresh, and now he can jump infinitely. And that's okay for this example. Okay, so now we're going to add the platforms. And we're going to use this platform image that I made on Piskel. So up here, I'm going to make a platform variable, and I'm going to set platform to a sprite with game.add.sprite. And then I'm going to enable physics on this platform. So actually, instead of saying this line again for a platform, we can just make the argument an array. So I can just say atom and platform inside one array, and that will enable physics on both atom and platform. And then in our update function, we have to check for collisions between Adam and the platform. So we'll say game.physics.arcade.collide. And we will have Adam and platform collide. Platform doesn't have any. Okay, so now when I jump on it, they collide. But 
Because it's a platform, we don't really want the platform to move. So to fix this, it's super simple. All you have to do is say the name of the sprite, so platform dot body dot immovable equals true. So this will just make the platform immovable, so it doesn't move. So when I jump on it, the platform doesn't move. Now let's say we have a bunch of platforms. It's not very wise to have a variable for every platform in the game, so we wouldn't have something like platform 1, platform 2, platform 3, etc. We can actually just make a group of platforms. So I'll just make a variable at the top and call it platform group and then I will set platform group to game.add.group so now that phaser knows that platform group is a group we can create platforms with it so we can say platform group dot create and then the arguments are the x and y positions and then the sprite that you want to use for the platform and I'll make two platforms so there they are we haven't added any code so that they collide so let's do that now so let's just add physics to the platform group by adding it to this array right here and then we are going to use set all and make all of the platforms in platform group immovable so we're going to set all so we're going to say set all body dot immovable and we're going to set it to true and then in our update function instead of saying game dot physics dot arcade dot collide with atom and platform group as our two arguments, we can actually just make this second argument an array and just add platform group to that array. So now atom will collide with platform and platform group. So I'm going to save my code, refresh, and it looks like he's colliding with the platform groups. So this concludes. Okay, so now we're going to start state six. The end result will look something like this. So here's state six. You can see that it's a volcano and it erupts every half second. You'll also notice that there's a two second delay between starting the game state and the volcano actually erupting. So for this example, all we're using is time events and a particle emitter. So that's state six. I've already preloaded my images. So we have, so we have these two balls that we're gonna use for lava and this volcano. So to start, let's just add our volcano to our game. So I'm gonna make a variable called volcano and set it to a sprite. And then I'm going to set the anchor point of our volcano so that it appears at the bottom of our screen. There we go. So that's pretty much it for the volcano. Now we just have to add the time events and the particles. So actually we can just chain these two lines and I don't think, and delete this variable. So it all looks the same. Okay, so now let's add the emitter to our game. Okay, so now let's add particles to our game. So I'm going to make a variable called emitter, and we're going to set that to game.add.emitter, parentheses. So an emitter is basically just like a point for particles to appear. So our arguments will just be the location of our emitter, so x and y. And then our third argument will be the maximum number of particles. So we'll just give this guy 2,000 particles. Next, we're going to make our emitter emit particles. And I misspelled it right here, so I'll fix that. So to make our emitter emit particles, we'll say emitter.make particles. And then our first argument will be the particle that we want to use. So if we wanted to just use one particle, we would say something like red ball. So this emitter would only emit red ball particles, but we want to emit the red and orange ball particles. So we're going to put this in an array, and it will be an array of the keys of the images that we want to use. So we'll use red ball and orange ball. The next argument is the frame that we want to use. So if you had something like a sprite sheet, you could pick what frame you want to use, but because we have an array here, it's going to be picked by random. So we can just make it zero. So we can just say zero because because that's the default value and the particles are going to be picked at random so it doesn't really matter. The next argument will be the number of particles to generate. So we can just say 5000 and then the next arguments are if you want the particles to collide with other arcade bodies. So we don't have any arcade bodies for this example so we'll just say false. And then the last argument will be if the particles can collide with the world. So we'll make that true. 
Okay, so now we can just start our emitter, and we can do so with just emitter dot start parentheses, and then our arguments will be if the particles explode at once. So we don't want that. So we'll say false, because we want the particles to come out like a stream. The next argument will be how long the particles will last for. So each particle will last five seconds, so 5,000 milliseconds. And then the third argument will be how frequent we want to emit a single particle. So we're gonna emit a particle every 20 milliseconds. Save our code, refresh. And now our emitter is emitting particles. So let's make our particles jump up in the air more so that they can arc and it just looks like the volcano is having a more violent eruption. So we can set the speed of the particles with emitter.maxparticlespeed.set parentheses. And then we can just set the maximum horizontal and vertical speeds of the particles. So for this example, the horizontal speed of the particles doesn't really matter. So I'll just set it to 300, but we do want the particles of our emitter to always go up. So I'll set the maximum speed to negative 300. So it will have a velocity of negative 300 when the particle is first emitted. And then we'll set the minimum speed to negative 100. So now the y velocity of our particles will always be between negative 100 and negative 300. So it's always going to go up. And then we'll just set the minimum x value to negative 300. So that looks a little better. We can also add gravity to the particles with emitter.gravity. And we can just set that to 300 so that the particles will fall down faster. So now that we have our emitter working, we can add the time event. So we can change the way our volcano erupts. So for our first time event, We'll give the volcano a two second delay between first starting the game state and the volcano actually erupting. So we'll say game.time.events.add, and then we'll say 2000 for 2000 milliseconds. And then the second argument will be a callback function. So we'll just give it an anonymous function. And let's take this line right here and paste it inside the callback function. So if we save our code, refresh, and go to state six, you can see that it takes two seconds for the volcano to start erupting. So this event is only added once. So after two seconds, it calls this function right here and it never calls this function ever again. So let's add an infinitely looping time event with game.time.events.loop parentheses. And our first argument will be how often we want to loop this time event. So we'll say every half second or every 500 milliseconds and then we'll give it a callback function. And in our callback function, we're just gonna check if our emitter is on, and if it is on, we're gonna turn it off, and if it's off, we're gonna turn it back on. So we can just do that with a simple if and else statement. So to check if the emitter is on, we can just say emitter.on, and if emitter.on is true, we'll set it to false, else we'll set emitter.on to true. Let's save our code, refresh, and there goes our volcano. So this concludes state 6. Okay, so now we're going to work on state 7. The final result will look something like this. So here's state 7. All it is is a arrow that will point in the direction that you swipe. And, and one thing to take note of is that if you just click, a swipe doesn't register. You have to swipe a certain distance for it to register as a swipe. And if we change this variable called leeway, our code will have a higher tolerance on what will be considered a swipe. So that's state seven. So it looks kind of simple because it kind of is, but this game state is more focused on algorithms, which are important when you're making games. So to start, let's just add the arrow to our game. So here I've already preloaded our arrow image. So I'll make a variable called arrow at the top. And we're going to set arrow to a sprite. And we're going to put it in the center of our game. So there we go. And now what we want to do is we want to add event listeners so that whenever our mouse is down or let up, we want to call a certain function. So the way we can do this is we can just say game.input.input 
on down dot add and we'll have a function called start swipe so here we can just say start swipe is a function and for now we can just console.log where our mouse is or where or where our finger is pressing down if we're on a touch screen so to get the position of the pointer you can just say game dot input dot x and game dot input dot y so i'll save the code refresh have a extra t there now you can see that whenever i click we get the position of our pointer which in this case is our mouse but it will also work if you're using your phone and you just tap the screen with your finger so now let's make a function that gets the swipe direction whenever our input is up. So we'll say game.input.onup.add and we're going to make a function called get swipe direction. And we can just console.log the endpoints here by copying the start swipe method. So now whenever I press down on the screen, we get the location of our pointer. And whenever I let up, we get the location again. Okay, so now we're going to make a few variables and we're going to call them start point x, start point y, end point x, and end point y. And then in our start swipe and get swipe direction methods, we will just set these variables to the x and y position of game.input. So now that our code knows where we're pressing down with our mouse and where we're letting up with our mouse, we can add if statements in our get swipe direction method to determine what direction we just swiped in. So the way I approached this was if the change in X is greater than the change in Y, then we know for sure that the swipe was horizontal. Else, if the change in Y between the start and end points was greater than the change in X, then we know for sure that it was a vertical swipe. So let's just code that now. So I'll make an if statement and an else statement. And in our if statement, we'll just console.log if it was horizontal or vertical. So here, we're going to console.log horizontal if the swipe was horizontal, and else we're just going to console.log vertical. So now between the parentheses, I'm just going to check if the change in y is less than the change in x. Because if the change in x is greater than the change in y, then we know it's horizontal. So we're going to use the abs method or absolute value. So that way it doesn't matter if the number is negative or positive, because if you swipe from left to right, then the change in X is going to be a positive number. But if you swipe from right to left, the number is going to be negative, but the distance of the swipe was still the same. So that's why we're going to use the absolute value method. So I'll just say end point Y minus end point start point y less than the difference between the x value of our start point and our end point. Okay, so I'm going to save the code, refresh. So when I swipe horizontally, we get horizontal. And actually, we can just delete these console.logs now. So when I swipe horizontally, we get horizontal. And if I swipe vertically, we get vertical. Okay, so now we're going to make our arrow point in the direction that we swipe to. So I'm going to make a variable called swipe direction and that's going to be the angle that our arrow points at so right now the angle is zero but if it's pointing to the right it'd be 90 if it's pointing down it'd be 180 and if it's pointing to the left that would be 270 so the last line of our get swipe direction method will be arrow dot angle equals swipe direction so now let's set swipe direction to to whatever direction that we swiped in so for horizontal let's make an if and an else statement so if we're swiping horizontally and our start point is less than our end point, then we know that we swiped right. So if my swipe starts here and ends here, the x value of my start point will be less than the x value of the end points. So in code, we can just say if end point x is greater than start point x, then swipe direction equals 90. So this is pointing right. And if this isn't true, and we know that our swipe is horizontal, then the only other direction would be left. So that would be 270. So I'll save my code, refresh. And now you can see that we can have the arrow point in the left or the right direction. So now I'm just going to take this if and else statement and put it in vertical. And then I'll switch out the x for y's. And then I'll switch out the x's for y's. So if our endpoint was here, and then our endpoint was here, then that would be down. So we can just set this to 180. And if it's not down, then it's up. So then our angle would just be zero. So I'll save my code, refresh. And now 
we can swipe in all four directions. So one issue here is that if I just click, the arrow is going to point up. That's because when I click, the starting points and the ending points are the same. So if we start at this if statement, because our start and end points are the same, one is not less than or greater than the other, so it defaults to the else statement. And again here, the start points are the same, so one isn't greater than the other, and so it just defaults to up. So one way to fix this is to just have our get swipe direction return false if we are just clicking on the screen. So if the change in X or the change in Y is not greater than a certain threshold, then we won't do anything. So near the beginning of our function, above our if and else statement, we'll just say if, and then we're just gonna return false. So now I'm just gonna take the absolute value of the change in Y and say if it is less than a certain threshold, so let's say 10. So if it's less than 10 and the change in X is also less than 10, then we're just gonna do nothing and return false. So here I'm clicking and nothing's happening. And let's actually change 10 to a variable called leeway. And now everything is working fine. So again, this state wasn't necessarily focused on phaser, but more of but more about algorithms. And I thought that this example would be really helpful if you were gonna make a mobile specific game that incorporated swiping. Okay, now we're gonna work on state eight. The final result will look something like this. So this is state eight. It's just a state that spells out text for you in a specified width. So it's very useful for speech boxes or if you're just telling a story in your game but it's also just pretty cool to look at. So adding text to your game is actually pretty simple. So this, this state focuses more on algorithms, which are, which are important. So this is state eight. So adding text to your game is pretty straightforward. All you have to do is say game.add.text, parentheses, and then the arguments will be the X and Y position of your text. And then the third argument is what you want the text to say. So pretty straightforward. So now we're going to make it more complex by having the text type itself out, which will be really useful for speech bubbles or telling a story in your game or just making your game look more dynamic. So here I have some lorem ipsum text, which is just Latin filler text. It doesn't mean anything. And it's just text to fill up space, which will later be replaced with actual sentences. So let's make a method called spell out text. So we don't actually need our update function for this. So I'll just replace update with spell out text. And what our method will take will be the X and Y position of our text, the width of our text. So how wide the text box is, the actual text that we want to display, the font size, the speed at which the text is spelled out, and we can have an optional font. So when we call our spell out text method, it's going to first display one character, and then it's going to display the next character, and then the next character, and then the next character, etc. So it's going to be a loop. So let's make a variable called loop, and let's set it to game.time.events.loop, parentheses. And the first argument will be the speed, so how often this loop event is going to loop. And then the second argument will be the function that we're going to call, and we are going to make a function called add char. So... Here, I'll just say function add char, and the add char function will append one character to the text that it's supposed to be displaying. So up here, let's make a variable called sentence, and we're going to set it to some kind of text. So our first argument will be the x and y position, which we'll get from these two arguments here. Initially, sentence will have no text in it, so we can just make an empty string, and because of this loop event, it will append a character to this empty string every however many seconds. It will append a character to this empty string every time this event loops. So after this empty string, we'll make another argument, and that argument will be an object. And this object carries anything related to the font of your text. So for example, I can change the font size of the text with font size. And here we have a pretty big font. I can also change the color of the text with fill. So if I wanted it to be white, I could put in the hex code for a specific color. And there are a few more options, but we're just gonna use font size, fill, and the actual font of the text in this example. So going back to this argument, inside this object, we are going to set font size to font size plus px, which is, or, which is short for pixels. We're gonna make fill the fill color, so 
I guess we should add fill here. And then we're going to add the font. So this font will correspond to this font, this fill will correspond to this fill, etc. So now we have to write some code that appends each character to our sentence variable. So let's make a variable called index. And the index will be the index of where we are in terms of how much of the sentence we've typed out. So initially, index will be zero because the first character that you want to print out is index zero. So in add char, we can just say sentence.text plus equals text brackets index. And then we are going to increment index by one every time we call the add char function. So now let's call the spell out text method. So we'll say this dot spell out text. And now we'll just put in some arguments. We haven't done anything with width yet, so any number will do. And we will use this lorem ipsum text. And we're going to add a character every, and our font size will be 30. And we're going to add a character to this text every 40 milliseconds. And fill can just be white. And we haven't added anything for font. So the font will just default to phaser's default font. So let's save the code. Refresh, and there it is. Now it's typing itself out, except it goes off the screen. And also, when our text is finished typing itself out, you can see that we get this error because right here, once the index is greater than the length of the text string, it's out of bounds, and so we have to stop this loop from looping once we're at the last index. So let's first fix the issue with the text going off the screen. My solution to this was to make an invisible text that you couldn't see, and once it was a certain width, we would know to add another line to this text that we can see. So I'm gonna make a variable called current line, and let's just put it at the top of our game. And because we want our text to be invisible, we don't need fill. And now we can add logic to see when we can add another line to our sentence. So you'll notice that if sentence was a global variable, text and phaser have a width in pixels. So while we're adding characters to our sentence, we can check the width of our invisible line at the top. And if it's greater than the specified width, then we'll just make the text from sentence go to another line. So current line will have the same text as sentence. The only difference is is once it reaches the specified width, then we will delete the text that it currently has, but it will still keep typing out the next text that is being added to sentence. So let's make an if statement. And in it, we are going to check if the width of current line is greater than width. So this width up here, that is, so this width right here. So if the width of current line is greater than width, we are going to make sentence go to another line. I mean, and we can do so with a backslash n, so backslash n will just mean go to another line in JavaScript. And we are going to set the text of current line to an empty string. So let's save our code, refresh. And now our text is working, except you can see that once we run out of text, the character that's supposed to be added to sentence and current line is undefined. But you'll also notice another issue is that we'll go down to another line regardless if it's in the middle of a word or not. So let's just add some more logic here that checks if the current character is a space. So we'll say text bracket index equals a space. So that way, only if the current character that's being appended to sentence is a space, then we'll go down to a line. Otherwise, it will finish that word until it reaches a space, and then we'll go down to another line. So let's run our code. Forgot a, another equal sign. And sorry for not making this English, but, but the words are being printed out in full. So sentence is not going down to the next line when it's in the middle of a word. So now let's fix this issue of printing out an undefined character. And again, that's because once index is greater than the length of our text string, this character at text bracket index does not exist. So that's why it's printing out undefined. So now let's make another if statement that checks if we are on the last index of our text string. So if index is greater than or equal to text.length minus one, then we're gonna stop this game loop. I mean, and we can do so with game.time.events.remove, and we can remove the variable that corresponds to the game loop. And let's also console.log stop. So let's save our code, refresh. 
and it looks like it worked pretty well. So now let's make the text of current line invisible because we don't need to see it anymore. And we can simply do that with current line dot alpha and alpha is just the opacity of something. So let's just set it to zero, which means you can see right through it. So there we go. Okay, so now let's add some different fonts because Phaser has this one default font and you don't want your font to look like everyone else's font and you don't want your game to have the same font as everyone else's game. So we're gonna use Google Fonts. So if you head over to Google Fonts, there's an array of different fonts. So I'm just gonna pick two of them. And once you've found your fonts, you wanna click this button and then you wanna scroll down and hit the JavaScript tag and, and you wanna copy this line right here. So you don't want to include the HTTPS colon. Next in your preload function, we have to load that script. So we'll just say game.load.script. And then our first argument will be web font in quotes. And then the second argument will be what we just copied in quotes. And, one, and once you have this line written down, you only need to include this line once, even if you have multiple fonts. So go back to Google fonts and you also want to copy this object web, web font config. So just copy it and paste it there. And what this object is for is so that this script knows what fonts to load. So now if we want to use this font, we can just take this word right here and we don't need to include these two colons. In fact, we don't even need these, so we can just delete them. And let's give this text some font and let's change the font of this text to the Google font that we just loaded. And let's make the font size a little bigger. So now you can see that we have a different font. So now let's get another font. This one looks cool. And we could just take the font, go to the JavaScript tag, and we can just copy this part and add it to the families array. And let's call spell out text again, except we'll change the font. And let's change the color. And let's change the speed. So actually that's pretty hard to read. So let's, let's just make it black. So there we go. That's state eight. Okay, now we're gonna work on state nine and the final result will look something like this. Okay, here's state nine. It is a high score system that uses Firebase. And Firebase is basically just a database that updates in real time. There are two buttons. Button one generates a score between zero and 100. And it takes the array from our database, sorts it, and then pushes it back to the database. And button two just clears the database. So if we open up another window and go to the same URL, you can see that when I change the score here, it also changes in the other window. And just to prove that this that these high scores are connecting to the same database and that the input that I'm putting in my computer is not going to both windows, I'll go to state zero. And you can see that only one window is affected at a time. So this high score system is actually being connected to a database. So that's state nine. So first, let's make some test data so that we get the text to work in our game. And then we'll connect to Firebase later. So up here, I'm going to make two variables, HS text, which will be the text representing the high scores. And we'll set it to an array and you'll see why later. And then the second variable will be HS or just high scores. And we'll make this an array that goes from 10 to one. And now in our create function, let's make a for loop and our for loop will loop 10 times. And here we're just gonna add text that shows the ranking of each score. So our so we can just say game.add.text parentheses, then we'll put the X position and then the Y position. So the first number, which is one, will be put at the Y position of 100, which is around here. And then every time we loop, we want to increase the Y position. So we will just add I times 90. So each loop will put the text 90 pixels lower than the previous text. And the text that we will display is I plus a dot. And let's give this text a font size of 40 pixels. Save our code, refresh. Okay, it looks like we're cutting off the 10. So let's just change this 100 to 20. Okay, so you'll notice that all the numbers are in line until we reach the number 10. And that's just because 10 has one extra character. So we can change the anchor point of the text so that they are drawn from the right side to the left. 
So we can just say anchor dot set to, and so we'll put one. So it will be drawn from the very right side of the text, and we don't really care about the y, so we'll just put zero. Okay, so now all the numbers are in line. Now let's make another for loop. And what this for loop will do is it will iterate through every element in the high score array. So var i equals zero is less than 10. And then we'll increment i by one after every loop. So every time we loop, we are going to add an object to this to the high score text array. And that object represents a line of text in phaser. So I'll just take this line right here and paste it. And then for the text, we will just have the HS array, and then we'll get the element from that array. So we'll just put in I, and it looks like it's offset because we are not incrementing I, because I in this for loop is one less than the I in this for loop. So we'll just say I plus one and put them in parentheses. Okay, now we have our high scores displayed properly. Okay, so now let's connect to Firebase. So what you wanna do is you want to go to firebase.com and log in. And then once you're at the dashboard, you want to create an app. So I'll just name this phaser demo and then click create new app and then click manage app. So this is our database. Okay, so now we have to download Firebase and put it in our app. So I already have everything installed on my computer, but to start using Firebase, what you need is to install Node.js so just go to nodejs.org and download it. And after you've done that, you want to go to bower.io. And when you install Node.js, they also install NPM, which stands for Node Package Manager. And we're going to use Bower to install Firebase. So what you want to do is copy this command right here and then open up your terminal, and then you wanna paste the command here and press enter. If it gives you an error, what you have to do is say sudo npm install dash g bower, and then it will prompt you for your password, and then it should download properly. But you need to have node installed to use npm. So just write this command down and press enter. I'm not gonna do it because I already have it installed. Next, what you wanna do is you wanna use this command right here. So, so you can just type it out or go to this URL on GitHub. And then in terminal, you want to change directories to your project. So I'll just say CD space, and then I'll drag in my folder to get the path, enter. And then you want to paste the command here and press enter. And now we have a Bower components folder in our directory with Firebase in it. Now what we have to do is load Firebase as a script in our index.html file. So at the top, right below phaser.min.js, we'll create another script tag and we will set the source to Bower Components, Firebase, and then firebase.js, and close the tag. Now over in state nine, we want to create a variable called ref, which is short for reference. And then in our create function, let's set ref to new Firebase, parentheses. And then you wanna take this URL right here, which will be different because everyone will have a different name for their app. And then you wanna paste it between the parentheses just like that. So I'll save the code, go to state nine, and then open up your console. And if I type in ref, you can see that there's some code. It's kind of hard to understand, but it's just a reference to your database. So now what you want to do is create a variable called object, and we want to set it to an object with a property of HS or high scores, and it will just contain 10 zeros in an array. So now we can just send this array over to Firebase. So what you want to say is ref dot set parentheses and our object will be the argument. So I'll press enter. And now if you go over to Firebase, you can see that we have now saved our high score object with our 10 zeros. Next, we're going to get the data from Firebase and we're going to replace this text with the actual data. So in the create function, let's say ref dot on. And then our first argument will be value. So whenever we get a new value, we are going to call this callback function, which will be our second argument. And then our callback function will take one argument and we'll just call that snapshot, which will be all the data that's in our database. So whenever we get a new value and we call this callback function, our callback function should re-render the text. So we have to make a function called update high score text. And what we're going to pass it is snapshot. And then to get the actual value of what's in snapshot, we have to call the val method and val will be this entire object. So we have to say dot hs to access the high score property. So I'm just gonna comment this line out first and then I'll just console.log what snapshot is to get a better understanding of how Firebase works. So I'm gonna save the code and refresh the local server. And when I go to state nine, 
Oh, I spelled console wrong. Okay, so this right here is what snapshot is. So a lot of this information is just stuff we don't need. So we have to say snapshot.val and then the parentheses. So now this is what's being console.logged and you can see that it's an object with our high score array. And so we just have to say .hs at the end to get the array of high scores. And if I go over to Firebase, I can manually change the data. So if I wanted the first one to be 82, I could just type it in, press enter. Notice that we have a new value in our database, and then we'll just call this callback function again. So I'll delete this console.log and uncomment this line. And now we're going to make our update high score method. And this method will take an array of high scores. And what we're going to do is just change the text of HS text. So I'm going to take this for loop, copy it, and just paste it here. And then we can just say HS text bracket I dot text equals an element in the high score array. So now if we try to call this update high score text method with this dot update high score text, you can see that update hs text is not a function. So if we console.log this inside this callback function, you can see that this is the window of our browser. So one way to fix this is to just create a variable outside of this callback function, and we'll just call it update hs text and we will set it to this dot update hs text, and we'll delete the this here. So I'll save my code, refresh, and there you go. Now we're connected to Firebase. Now you can just change the data here, and it re-renders the text. Now let's add some buttons so that we can simulate sending a score to, to Firebase and re-rendering the text, and we'll have a second button that just clears all the high scores. So in our preload method, Let's load some button images that I made earlier. And now let's just add those buttons to our game with game.add.button. So there's our two buttons. And now let's add some functionality to them. So button two is just gonna clear our database of all the high scores, which is pretty easy. All we have to do is say ref.set parentheses, and then we'll just set an object with an HS property and an array of 10 zeros. So let's save the code, refresh. So right now our database has 82 and three. But if I press button two, you can see that our text went back to zero and now our high score array is all zeros. So pretty simple. Now what button one will do is it will simulate sending a score to Firebase. So let's make a variable called score and we're gonna set it to math.round and between the parentheses, we'll say math.random parentheses times 100. And then let's just console.log our score. So let's save the code, refresh, and now whenever I press one, you can see that we get a random score every time I click on it. So now we have to get the object that we get from Firebase. So I'm just gonna make a variable up here called FB object or Firebase object. And we are going to set FB object to snapshot.val.hs. And because Firebase object is a global variable, we can use the same reference here in this callback function and here in this callback function. So after we create a random score, let's take FB object. So FB object is kind of a bad name for our high score array. So, and you might want to add other stuff to your, to this object. So I'll just delete dot HS right here and I'll just put it here. And then in this callback function, we will take FB object dot HS and we will push our score to it. And then we'll send FB object back to Firebase with ref dot set parentheses FB object. Save our code, refresh. So now when I click one, a random score is 54. And now you can see that we have an array with 54 added to the end. So now we have to sort our array and we have to cut it to the length of 10 because we're only gonna have 10 high scores. So right after we push score to the high score array in FB object, we have to set fb object dot hs to fb object dot hs dot sort and then sort will take a callback function that takes two arguments a and b and it will return b minus a and this will sort the array from largest number to smallest number so for example if i had an array of random numbers and i just did sort without a callback function you can see that it sorts in a way that's kind of like alphabetically. So you can see that it sorts by the first number. So two, three, four, four, five. So by adding this callback function, we're having it sort from greatest number to lowest number. So actually we can just take this sort right here and put it here. 
So now it sorts from highest to lowest. And if we switch B minus A with A minus B, you can see it sorts from lowest to highest. So this part sorts the high score array. Now we just have to cut it so that it's always the length of 10. And we can do so with slice and it will start at zero. So it will include index zero and it will stop at index 10, but it won't include index 10. So this will slice the array from zero to 10, including index zero, but not including index 10. It stops at nine. So let's save our code, refresh. And now whenever I click the one button, you can see that we are adding a score to our Firebase high score array. And it also sorts the scores. So here we're creating scores that are lower than the last high score. And so you can see that they're not being appended to the high score array. And if we click two, it resets the high score. And then you'll also notice that when we first go to our state for a split second, you can see our original high scores. So we actually don't need this high score array and we can just replace that text with an empty string and I'll just delete it. So there we go. Now we're gonna add some security to our database because anyone with Firebase installed on their project can just use this line right here and read and write data to Firebase. So the simplest way to secure your database is to use a custom token. So if you go over to your dashboard for your app, we want to set security rules and we'll just set re the read and write properties to auth or authorized not equal to null. And this just says, People can only read and write data to this database if auth exists. So I'll save those rules. And now when I restart state nine, you can see that nothing happens because we're not authorized to read data from the database. So now we have to, so now we have to authorize ourselves so that we can read and write data. So if we go back to the dashboard and click secrets, you'll, you'll see this key. And what you want to do is copy this key which you should never share with anyone except people working on the project. And then to get authorized, we'll say ref dot off with custom token parentheses. And our first argument will be that key. So in quotes, just paste it there. And then our second argument will be a callback function. And all this function is going to do is say if you were authorized or not. So it will take one argument, which is just error. And if error exists, then we'll console.log error. Else, if there is no error, then we'll just console.log authorized. So now with the correct code, we can see that we were authorized and now we have access to the database. However, if our code is incorrect, so I'll just add a zero at the end, so it's not the correct custom token, you can see that we get an error and we can't read or write from our database. So I'll change this back to the correct custom token and that's it. And because Firebase is real-time data, you can see that the code from Firebase changes in real time whenever I click the button that adds a new score, as well as deleting the scores. And I can change the score here, and it will also change in real time. So that concludes state nine. Hello, it's come to my attention that the Firebase portion of this tutorial is out of date. So in this video, I'm going to teach you how to update the uh, state nine of this phaser demo so that it uses the latest version of Firebase, which looks like this now. So the first thing you wanna do is you want to delete Bower components. Um, you don't, you no longer need Bower or Node. Next thing you wanna do is in index.html, you want to delete that line that imports the, uh, the Firebase component from the Bower components folder. In state nine, you can delete this URL as well as make Firebase lowercase. And then to get the database, you just say dot database, call that method. And then you have to say ref for like where in the database you want to store this data, which for now, it will just be at the root of the database. So you just use a forward slash. So after you've done that, you can delete this block of code, which authenticates the Firebase stuff for you. And if we save our code, 
it's not going to work because there's a lot of stuff that needs to be done on the console. So once you log into the Firebase console, you want to create a new project. I'll just call this state 9, create project. And I'm just going to set up the debugger console stuff here while that's loading. Okay, so we're getting this error. Firebase is not defined. Makes sense. Okay, so this is the console. The first thing you want to do is in database. Once you click the database tab, go to rules. And this, these uh, two lines right here basically just say if the if the client side code has not authorized uh, their Firebase database, it means they can't read or write. So if authentication does not exist, then you cannot read or write. So this tutorial doesn't focus purely on Firebase. It's This is just an example of how you can use Firebase in Phaser. So I'm going to ignore this whole authentication part and just say true. And this is dangerous because this means that anyone who connects to your database can read and write, and that's not good. But again, this isn't really a tutorial on Firebase. And, and this is just for the sake of showing you how you can use Firebase in Phaser. So now that we have set these to true, you can publish them. Next in overview, you can select what platform you want to use Firebase in. So we're using the web. So click that web button. Next, you want to copy this block of code and paste it right here. So if we save this and run our code, and it says it cannot read the HS property of null. And that's because in our database, there is no HS property, it is null. So we have to add a property in our database called HS. And one way to do that is to just do it in our console. So if we in our console, we can type in ref and we can see that it is connected to Firebase because it returns this object. So to create the HS property, just do ref.set and that's a method that takes an object. And in this object, we'll have the HS property and it's a high scores. It's a high score list. So we'll use an array and we'll just pass in 10 zeros. So, so that's 10 zeros, I think. And just press enter. Okay, so you can see that we now have zeros here. And in our database, we have the HS property and we have 10 zeros. So I think that's all we need to do. So if we just refresh everything, go to state nine, you can see that it is now populating our database with simulated scores. So hopefully that was helpful and please leave your comments on these videos if you have any questions or would like to give me any feedback. Thanks.